Awesome. Welcome, everybody, to our Skyline Hatch VCE exam revision series 2022 for Literature Units 3 and 4 in partnership with UBS. It's really exciting uh, to see so many people here today, and uh, I'm really keen for smashing out and keen to smash out some literature content uh, over the next couple of hours. So welcome, everybody. Before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today. I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past and present, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hope of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across the nation. So welcome to our Skyline Hatch VCE revision series. Uh, today is of course literature and it's wonderful to see you all here. Uh, we're going to be going over a wide variety of things today, uh, but I thought before we jump into the content and some of the explanations, everything like that, I, I just do a bit of an introduction. Um, my name's Josh. I graduated in 2018, which is a, a fair while ago now, but I was using the same study design that the, the current one is. This is the last year of that study design, and I graduated in the second year of its conception. So I went to school in a very small uh, rural town in Victoria, about three to four hours drive from the city. Um, and I really wanted to do well. I, I was never an English person. I, I, I always thought of myself as like a maths person. And I, I took up literature on a complete whim. It was the only English I did. I didn't do English mainstream or language. I just did literature. Um, and, you know, in, in 2017, in my year 11, I, I struggled with literature. I thought it was a very, very hard, um, a very hard subject. It was new and all this analysis kind of blew my mind. Like it, was, it was crazy looking at the actual language. And, and coming into 3-4, I really wanted to do well. I, I knew that I um, really wanted to perform quite strongly in, in my maths and my science subjects. And I was definitely looking on track to do that. But literature being my only English subject meant it would be in the top four of my of my scores, um, regardless of what my actual score was. So I kind of thought to myself, I was like, I really need to get a move on. Um, I was averaging, you know, scores that might have got me a, a 25 to a 30 throughout the year, which I would have been happy with. But I really wanted to kind of boost that up a bit. And, and come semester two, um, you know, maybe three months ago for, for you guys, I kind of rephrased the way I was looking at literature and the way that I was um, writing and, and analysing things. And I ended up doing much, much better than I expected. I ended up getting a raw 48 in lit and I graduated with an ATAR of 99.85. Um, I'm currently doing my uh, Doctor of Medicine at Monash University, which has been, been interesting and fun. And I like to include a fun fact and during lockdown, I, I did eating challenges on Facebook Live for my friends, and that there is a screenshot of one of those eating challenges. So that's my, my fun fact of the day. Uh, we've also got our wonderful support tutor here today as well. Asma, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So hi, everyone. My name is Asma. I am a second year um, arts and criminology student at Monash University. Um, I graduated in 2020 with an ATAR of 90.25. And I did literature as well, and I got a 30. Um, and yeah, I, like Josh as well, I found it quite challenging, but I also found it really interesting as well. And I'm sure you guys will hopefully find it interesting too. Um, and yeah, today I'll just be helping and assisting Josh. Um, and yeah, hope you enjoy today's um, lecture. Awesome. Thanks so much for that. Um... I also just like to thank UBS for their incredible support over this these lecture series. It's thanks to UBS that we're able to, to run this revision series and run this, this seminar specifically uh, for VC students. And we've been very thankful for their help and the volunteers they've provided um, throughout the series. Thank you very much. All righty. Well, let's jump into it. So let's go through a few things. So. First things first, this is a Zoom webinar. Always people who ask, if you go get out of the way, that means you can see me, I can't see you. Um, and you, you're not able to, to speak. Um, and that's completely fine because we've got a separate, a separate thing set up for to ask questions and everything like that. So we'll be having a look at the chat, uh, but we'd like to ask that if you keep the Zoom chat for immediate questions or um, and that's like for immediate stuff 
such as tech difficulties, you might not be able to hear us, something like that. And we're going to use a program called Mentimeter for any content related questions. So you're able to access that on your phone or your laptop. There's a QR code on the screen here. But at any point that you accidentally click out of it or anything like that, you notice down at the bottom of each slide, we've got this join us on Mentimeter, head to www.menti.com and use the code 12396682. So you're welcome to, to jump in there. So first things first, let's go through what we're going to be looking at. We, we're going to talk a little bit about you know, what the actual goals of VC literature, literature actually is. Um, uh, examining, you know, text through different lenses. Uh, we're looking at essay analysis in a critically evaluating language um, and looking at close analysis and, and concluding. So again, just like to remind you, keep, please keep your, um, your any questions to the Mentimeter. So we've got something going on right now. How are you feeling about the uh, literature exam? So open up the Mentimeter. There's also a Q&A function where any questions, instead of asking on the Zoom, you're able to ask through the Q&A function on the Mentimeter. It means it's all in one place. And when we get to the times where we're going to go through some of these questions, it's all together for us. Um, but we're getting quite a few interesting responses uh, on the on the Mentimeter currently. Uh, how are we feeling? Um, you know, some people are saying excited, some are motivated, some people are horrified, some are nervous, and these are all you know very realistic and, and very valid you know emotional responses. I know I was terrified at coming into my VC literature exam. Um, I yeah, I was absolutely terrified. So I, I think the first thing I'd like to stress is that, you know, these are completely normal feelings. It's very, very normal um, to be scared. Uh, I'll be feeling a bit overwhelmed coming up to, to the exam. It's a, it's a stressful time of year. One thing I will stress though, is that literature is one of these beautiful, unique subjects. It's not like chemistry where you know, you realize you've forgotten a certain chemical pathway and you can't do any of the questions. Literature is all about you and your analysis, how you have read a book and how you have applied a lens or a piece of analysis or anything like that, um, which, I, I've met, which I think makes it a really, really awesome subject to kind of jump into and, and get involved with. And we're going to go through some of the things and some of the strategies um, today that you might think you might utilize come the exam and you know, might boost your marks and make you feel a bit more confident. But we're going to go over the basics today as well, really refresh you on all the content that you might be expecting coming up to the literature exam. Alrighty, let's get to it. So the literature exam, what is it? Well, it's a two hour exam, which I think makes it quite nice. It's not one of those three hours where you're sitting there exhausted by the end of it. But you have 15 minutes of reading time and you have two hours of writing. Now, literature is really unique because you actually get two booklets. In my year, at least you did. You get a writing booklet to write down your essay and you get a big booklet that's full of all the prompts. Now, there's about 30 different texts for literature. You don't have to know all of them. There's no questions in the exam saying, you know, who did... Um, the, uh, who did Gatsby speak to in chapter 13 of The Great Gatsby? It, nothing like that. It's prompts and then passages. So each text is going to have its own unique prompt and each text will have three passages um, for you to analyse. And obviously you pick the text that you're doing. So section A is the use of a given prompt to analyse a text through the lens, lens of a perspective. So you are asked to write an essay about a text based on a prompt, but also applying a perspective. And section B is a close analysis of the three given passages to form a substantiated interpretation of a text. Now, these texts can't be the same. You can't do the same book for section A and section B, and more of that, they have to be in different mediums or different types. So if I've chosen to do poetry in my section A, you can't do, po I couldn't do poetry in section B, even if it's a different set of poets. If I've done a play in section A, I can't do a play, even if it's a different play in section B. So for example, I did section A, I did a play in section B, I did uh, poetry. Asma, do you remember what, what you did? 
Um, so for section, wait, let me have a look properly. I believe I did poetry. I, I remember looking at um Sylvia Platt. Awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, legendary. Um, so, so yeah, so we're going to be looking at, at, at these here today. And just one thing to keep in mind is, you know, making sure that um, you're not writing the same text, writing the, the, the essays on the same text, section A and section B, because they can't have said they give you a zero for the second one. You don't want that to happen to you. Um, all righty, let's jump into it. So first things first, literary, literary perspectives. What, what is a perspective? So look, the way I like to think about it is a perspective is almost like a pair of glasses that you put on um, when you're reading a text. And those glasses might be different color. You might miss some parts. You might gleam more information from another. And, and, and this brings me to this meme that, I, that I've, I've, I've used in these slides for many, many years now, because I think it's very, very relevant. Um, where the author, the author says, my curtains are blue. And you know, I'm sure you've all seen that meme and English teachers say, that it um, represents their sadness, the character's sadness and, and their melancholy, but what the author meant was that the, the, the curtains were blue. Now, I hate this meme. I, I strongly despise this because it, in my opinion, it doesn't matter, or it does, but it doesn't, it's not a huge deal what the author meant. Literature is about you. It's about what you interpret. And if you think that the curtains being blue in a passage, um, might contribute to an overwhelming feeling of, of melancholy or despair, then talk about it, then use it. Literary perspectives are all about gleaning information from the text or taking parts of the text to help substantiate a, a wider view of what's actually going on in our play or our poetry or our novel. It doesn't necessarily matter if, you know, the, the tropes and, and the things that the author has used in the text have been deliberate or not. It, it doesn't matter. What matters is how do they, their presence, contribute to the wider setting and the wider feeling and atmosphere of the text. If you think the curtains being blue means it helps contribute to the sadness of, of the character, yeah, let's talk about it. So in life, we evaluate a text through a lens. You, you and I will always evaluate a text through a lens. And that's going to be based on your own experiences. Two people from across the world might read the same book in the exact same way and still have very different interpretations of what's going on. The classic example is the book 1984 by George Orwell. You may have heard of it. It was banned in um, some communist countries for being anti-communist, and it was banned in capitalist countries for being anti-capitalist. Now, it, it can't be both of those things, but it's all about the reader's interpretation. So our lens is a result of our worldview, and our worldview can be based on experiences that we've had in our lives, our culture, our belief system, and that means that no two people are going to interpret the same passage or the same text in the same way. Now, in literature, we can kind of take a step back from our individual selves and we can use a lens that's a bit more well-defined to analyse as a basis of analysis for a text. So this lens acts as a pair of coloured glasses with which we can view the text and this can dramatically change how it's interpreted. For example, um, like, and I, I want to stress before I jump into my example, actually, I, I want to stress that this doesn't mean that two people using the different perspectives are going to have vastly different ideas. Like one's going to believe the book is about the world getting taken over by aliens and the other is going to believe it's about a, a medieval fantasy. Th that's not what it means. It means that the overall resolution of the text might be informed differently. For example, there was a text on the text list a few years ago called Heart of Darkness, which is about colonization in, in the Congo. Now, a Marxist perspective, which we'll talk about shortly, might view this text as, as and, and view the colonization of Africa as being you know, awful and, and resulting in cruelty because the European colonizers wanted um, to increase their capital, wanted to increase their wealth by exploiting the, the natural beauty and the minerals found in Africa. And therefore, this act of colonization was awful. At the same time, a post-colonial perspective can say, well, no, Europeans believed in, you know, um, 
supremacy and, and all these racist beliefs and and that led to slavery and decimating the, the landscape and that is why colonization is awful so in both of these texts and these are the you know, there's obviously going to be some big things we talk about today but for both of these lenses they've ended up in the same place that colonization was awful right based on this book but they've come to it through vastly different means that is what literature is all about the passage of you getting to a um, getting to a resolution, getting to an idea that aptly describes your text. So the first one that a lot of people use, and I think it's it definitely isn't the easiest perspective, but I think it's the one that it's it's, it's easiest to jump into. It's quite complicated, but it's easy to get that head start with 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 those perspectives, and it focuses on how literature reinforces or undermines the oppression of women socially, economically, or politically. And a feminist perspective is concerned with how a text represents gender roles and the consequences of that. And it's not just, you know, saying, um, oh, well, um, this, this female character said this and this female character said this, but they were spoken of by the male character. It, it's a lot more than that. I think another classic example is, from my understanding, Lord of the Rings, from my reading, I could never identify a point in which two female characters actually speak to each other. That's pretty crazy. And so this text has been written from an entirely male perspective. So the absence of female voices is very telling about, you know, what the gender roles are and, and you know, the, the consequences of that. Um, we might be looking at stuff, Martin, the text I did in year 12, Buried Child. Um, the, the first scene um, features a um, uh, the, the the breadwinner of the family who's who's drunk and he's sick. He's in the basement. He's on the um, he's on the couch, and the spotlight's on him. And from off stage, we hear the voice of his wife calling. Now, a feminist perspective could look at this and say, you know, his wife is up the stairs, and she has therefore ascended. Her voice is angelic. It's off from the off from the side. She's been able to escape this, this patriarchal, this, uh, this world in which she was viewed as a lesser. And at the same time, another person using the feminist perspective might say, the female voice, which is rational, which is telling this, this drunken guy you know, what to do and, and how to behave, is put off to the side. In fact, she's not even on stage. And the focus of the stage is on someone who's sick, someone who's you know, obviously very wrong, and, and everything like that. Um, so, so a feminist perspective can look at the same thing, or two people using the same perspective can look at the same thing and view it very differently. So there's a couple of key questions here. How does the text portray gender? How are sexual stereotypes reinforced? And are characters defined by gender norms? How do different sexes or different genders interact? Are female characters or non-binary characters given as much of a voice as male characters? For example, in Lord of the Rings, um, do characters just like strength or importance transform female characters in, into being male? And how are gendered roles undermined and disrupted? And there's a couple of key points here. And again, I'm gonna throw back today to some other, I might be, I'm, I'm obviously a little older than, than all of you. So excuse if my, if my pop culture references are, are a little off, but I think a really, a classic example of, of you know, quote unquote female empowerment in a lot of say, video games and movies and books leads to female characters being um, taking on the traits of, of traditionally of, of men. And therefore, in order to be powerful, they have to give up their femininity, which is obviously the, the feminist perspective will look at that and still condemn that. Like, why can't we have feminine heroes? And I think the best example of this that they sort of, you know, um, subverts its expectation is, is legally blonde i'm not sure if anyone's ever seen that movie but we it's about about a lawyer or this girl goes to law school and you know she's very proud of you know liking all, all the things that are very traditionally feminine and in the final scene uh, not, and not to do any spoilers but she wins the court case by using things that she you know, are proud of she doesn't have to give up her femininity to be successful and that is a great example of how um, characteristic, how, how uh, using feminine characteristics can, or feminine, feminine characteristics can be used by authors to, to, for success as compared to giving female characters male characteristics, for example. So these are all the things you want to be looking at. It's beyond just dialogue. It, it, it's sort of what's in the subconscious, what's written between the lines.
And when we look at these perspectives, there are some there's some key vocab we like to use with all of these that make it a little uh, a little easier to, to understand or or um, we just need these terms make it quite useful to show that you know what's going on. Intersectionality is a great one, which is where um, oppression exists in multiple facets. Gender policing, so people might be saying, well, no, you, you can't do that because that's a tr traditionally a, a man's job or traditionally a woman's job. Hegemonic masculinity or femininity, so this idea of, you know, the big buff machismo male and, and the housewife. Um, patriarchy and empowerment, deconstructing these ideas, phallocentric, so being very focused on, on the male experienced, um, which most texts are very, very phallocentric. Um, there's an internalized misogyny where we see, um, potentially see female characters who are fighting against the, um, against the, the better wishes of other female characters. And agency, so does someone have agency? Do, do they have the ability to make decisions for themselves? These are some key ideas that any one of you doing the feminist perspective should keep in mind. The other classic is the Marxist perspective, which isn't as much about, you know, reading the, the, the what's been laid out by Marx as it is using uh, a lens to investigate class conflict. Is there a difference between, you know, the working class and the upper class? And so the Marxist perspective kind of forgoes the aesthetic form of literature. It forgoes the, you know, looking at the, the beauty and the eloquence of literature to an extent um, to instead focus on the political and social undertones. So things we've got to look out for, you know, is there a ruling class? How do different social classes interpret the same set of events? For example, the, a, a strike on the streets could be viewed as very empowering for the working class, but at the same time, the ruling class might view that as, you know, um, coming, at that, like coming at them and quite aggressive towards them. How does the text reflect an economic base and how is the influence of capital portrayed? This is a really key one. Uh, and I've expressed it as capital because that's the terminology used in the Marxist perspective, but it's money, you know? What does money do? Again, so many classic examples in literature, but time and time again, we see this, this thing where someone becomes rich and gets money and they become evil and greedy and, and all of these different things and, and wanting more and more and more. That's a great place to start from a Marxist perspective. Who owns the means of production? And is the class divide recognisable? If you're looking back at a text that's set, you know, 100, 200, 300, 400 years ago, yeah, there's going to be a very clear divide um, between the people who are, you know, farming the lands or, or building the machinery versus the people who own it. Um, even in, in literature set today, you'll find a lot of books where you can very clearly distinguish between the people who are working class and the people who, who aren't. And so there's a couple of other key bits of vocab. The means of production, so where the money comes from, it's a bit, I think it's a bit outdated. It'd be quite hard to use it um, in the same way as it was traditionally today. But uh, bourgeoisie, the, uh, the ruling class and the proletariat, which is the working class. The superstructure, commodification, this is a great one to look at. Like, do we, for example, we might commodify water. If you're selling water and you, 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 or you're selling something like healthcare, that, that's commodification. Um, whereas other people might believe it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a right for everyone to have. There's also some other more niche things like dialectical materialism and false consciousness, but I'll leave that to all of you who are doing the Marxist perspective for the exam to delve a bit deeper into. And finally, the other big one that I, doesn't come up as much, but I think it's been gaining in popularity over the past few years is the, uh, psych the psychoanalytical perspective. And the psychoanalytical, psychoanalytical literary perspective, I think, is the most interesting. And it argues that the literary text offers insight into an author's anxiety and neuroses. So the perspective is used to illustrate that the characters are merely projections of an author themselves, so what the author is thinking. For example, we might find in a, a book that one particular character is punished a lot, and that can be, you know, viewed as, well, the author doesn't like that character or that character reminds the author of, of someone else. So it's kind of going a little bit more meta, looking at what the author is thinking. Uh, so there's a variety of things we can do here. Um, are there persistent presence of literary tropes and ideas like archetypes? What similarities exist between the protagonists and the authors and how are the characters praised or punished? Does the text resemble any common myths and legends? This is another great one that I'll talk a little bit about later, but often a lot of our texts that we're going to be reading are actually very similar to stuff that's been written, you know, 
300 or even a thousand years ago, but they've got to have a bit of new, a bit of a new spin on it, which could be, you know, your psychoanalytical perspective can look at that and say, you know, it might not have been deliberate, but their author isn't being inspired by the legend of Aegis or, or something like that. And when do these characters react, uh, act abnormally? And th this really comes in, I think some of you might be doing a, a books that are a little bit more whack and a little bit more strange. I know I did a couple in, in year 12. And, and this is like, this is the most pertinent point that you can use these, these, these anomalies and these sort of like, for, for those more abstract texts, you can, this is a really great one to use. So we'll be looking at stuff like latency, the unconscious mind and what that, what that does, displacement and transference, um, repression, which is where you might like keep something down, and neuroses, which is where you're intensely focused on something, projecting faults onto someone else, or compulsions. So that's a bit of a uh, intro into um, there's a bit of an intro into, I guess, some of the key perspectives. There are obviously much more, and I'm sure there are many of you here who are doing other perspectives and just the ones we've covered before. But let's jump into a little bit about identifying language for perspectives. So today I'm going to be using um, examples from some non-VCE books and from some VCE texts. The reason why I do that is because um, for the non-VCE ones, I just want to get your skills down. I don't really care about your analysis and what you view uh, for something like this. I want you to see how you're going to be picking this apart. Um, in terms of, of the ones that, that are VC related, it's a good bit of practice for those who, who are doing those texts, but I've made sure that any examples I've used that use texts that are currently in the study design, that they're also open up, that they're open for anyone who hasn't done those texts before to give them a go. So I'm going to read through this and then we are going to jump in and try and identify a few bits of language here. Before I could reply that Gatsby was my neighbor dinner, uh, was my neighbor, dinner was announced. Wedging his tense arm imperatively under mine, Tom Buchanan compelled me from the room as though he were moving a checker to another square. Slenderly, languidly, their hands set lightly on their hips, the two young women preceded us out onto a rosy colored porch, open towards the sunset where four candles flickered on the table in the diminished wind. Why candles, objected Daisy, frowning. She snapped them out with her fingers. In two weeks, it'll be the longest day in the year. She looked at us all radiantly. Do you miss, sorry, do you always watch for the longest day of the year then miss it? I always watch for the longest day of the year then miss it. We ought to plan something, yawned Miss Baker, sitting down at the table as if she were getting into bed. All right, said Daisy. What do we plan? She turned to me helplessly. What do people plan? Before I could answer, her eyes fastened an odd expression on her, on her little finger. Look, she complained. I heard it. We all looked. The knuckle was black and blue. You did it, Tom, as she said accusingly. I know you didn't mean to, but you did do it. That's what I get from marrying a brood of a man, a great big hulking specimen of a... I hate that word, hulking, objected Tom crossly, even in kidding. Hulking, insisted, insisted Jay, but Daisy. And that's from The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. So there's a lot to unpack there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move the Mentimeter onto the next slide. And what I want you to do is think of a perspective. It might be the perspective that we've just looked at, uh, the feminist, the uh, Marxist or psychoanalytical, or one that you're doing in school currently, if, if there's any different ones. And just take a second to have another quick read through here, write down your perspective in the Mentimeter and accompany that with, you know, ideas or quotes from the text that you think you could use for that perspective. And then we're gonna go through it together and we're gonna kind of go through and see how we deconstruct a text, how we rip it apart to find the bits that we're looking for. So again, I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes and you can put this on the, um, the actual Mentimeter. Um, you can put this down on the, on, on the Mentimeter whenever you're ready. So a couple of minutes here and I'd love to see some stellar responses, even if it's just, you know, something like the feminist perspective and I'll give you an example and how, um, how Tom, the male character, interrupts, for example. That's a great point to start. So any ideas like that, fantastic. So a couple of minutes, give it a go.
Alrighty, legend. So I've seen some incredible responses in the Mentimeter so far. So a lot of them have been about the feminist perspective, you know, looking at, say, for example, and I'm going to put this in blue, um, how the two young women preceded us, how they, let me I'll change your highlighter, it preceded us, um, and that um, shows that women are in front of the men, shows they're not oppressed by them, and how um, Daisy's insistence the word hulking at the end, even though Tom hates it, shows that she's not controlled by him. Um, but at the same time, we have this, you know, the, 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 the great hulking physical specimen. Um, it feeds into the male fantasy. And, and I would almost suggest when you start to look at these ideas, you re-look at them. Sure, the two young women moving out first might be, yeah, they might be in control. Or Daisy saying it one more time might be in control. But looking at the actual quantity, of, or the actual, looking deeper into the text and looking deeper into the passage itself, we see that that men drive the conversation. It is from a male gaze. It is from, it's written by a man. We see um, Miss Baker being referred to as Miss Baker instead of Tom Buchanan, as it is up here, like a, full, a first name, second name. Um, we see that Tom has committed an act of violence against a woman, and that's just disregarded. So even when our female characters are given some sense of agency, in reality, this is very much a male-driven world. And we've got another great one here from the Marxist perspective, how um, characters have access to, I'll do, I'll do a nice orange here, um, candles, and they go out onto a porch. Um, they moving up like from the room. This is obviously a very big house, big space, obviously quite wealthy. And we can see that here um, and it very much distinguishes them from, you know, maybe other classes of, of, of society and the fact they have access to that. And at the same time, in this same passage, we have, you know, this beautiful display of decadence and being able to just take time and make plans to watch the longest day of, in the year. That's not something a regular person does. That's not something who is someone who is working and someone who is, you know, going from paycheck to paycheck does, makes plans to celebrate the longest day of the year and then just somehow forgets it, right? And at the, when that's being used, we then also have this display of violence. And to me, that kind of shows, and this violence is considered completely normal. Like no one brings up, oh my goodness, why did he do that to you? Or are you okay? It's just, oh, you hurt me. It's completely normal in, in the setting of the text. So in this setting of decadence and, and wealth and capital, violence is completely normal. And that there, a, a Marxist, from a Marxist perspective, we can look at that and talk about the corrupting nature of this. You've had to exploit so many people to gain this wealth that exploitation is considered nothing new. And again, there's so many different ways to look at this. Um, and that's absolutely fantastic. Um, and I've got another fantastic one, even the look at... Um, the, the, the narrator, who obviously is new to this environment, is being, um, he, he's been characterised as a checker and merely a mere playing piece, whereas the people in control, the people running the game, is, is Tom Buchanan, the owner of the house. And, and so this isn't, this, you've had some absolutely fantastic examples here. So, so when we sort of start to look at texts and look at perspectives, we don't want to just do, do, look at the overriding ideas of the text, so they're very important. We need to be looking at the language. Literature is all about language. So when we do that, we want to kind of dig deep. Looking at these small things, like how a character is represented or compared as a checker, um, are, do, are female characters leading? I'm sure if they're doing that, but what is the overall message of the text here? In this passage, I read it as personally that men are in control. So looking at the individual language, but also looking at the more macro ideas and combining those together. And we're going to look at a few examples of how this is done perfectly. But great work for everyone who contributed. There is some absolutely fantastic responses here. So section A, these are the key points. We need to develop an informed interpretation of a text in response to a prompt drawing on a literary perspective. Now, the classic stitch up of a VCE literature student is forgetting about this. 
I did a set of practice, or my school did a set of practice exams, you know, in about September of my year 12. And we got a lot of interesting feedback from the, these external markers who said, look, a lot of you did and analyzed a text very, very well using a prompt, but kind of forgot about the perspective and tacked it on at the end. The prompt was about dreams and, and you know, dreaming and, and all that sort of stuff. And they talk about dreaming and, and what they want to do with their life. And then at the end of the, the paragraph, so I might um, put on, using a feminist perspective, we can see X, Y, Z. And they said, a lot of you also did fantastic essays looking at perspectives and then talk about you know, the feminist perspective in this book or the Marxist perspective and going into so much detail and then not, but they wouldn't add anything about dreams and dreaming or anything about the prompt until the final line of the paragraph. They'd say, this shows that the author is exploring their dreams, etc, etc, etc. The key point here is that these need to be fluid. They're together. You're not looking at a prompt uh, and then looking at a perspective, you're looking at a prompt and a perspective together. So the use of the lens must inform um, the basis of the essay around the key features presented by the prompt. So essentially how I'd sort of describe it is your, your perspective is like what you're using. It's how you're analyzing everything. And then using that perspective, you're answering the prompt. The first thing you've got to do, though, is break that prompt down. Now, in 2017, the first year of the study design, the prompts were awful. It was stuff like, you know, for some things, it was stuff like how are women treated in the text? And for anyone who prepared a Marxist or a psychoanalytical perspective, they didn't do well because the prompt said, uh, was specifically located to the feminist perspective. Now, in my, in my, and in my year, it was you know, the year after, my, my prompt was, uh, it was something about how there, there is no such thing as happiness, which is very, very vague and very general. And, and now they're a bit more, uh, a bit more structured, but not as you know, um, closely defined as you as you would require a specific perspective if you needed it. So let's have a look. So these are the uh, perspectives that were in the twenty eighteen exam, for example, or in twenty nineteen. There's a mix in here. But for example, consider the proposition that in Shepard's very child, no happy ending is possible for the characters. So when I look at that, I need to, that, that's a question I've got to be answering in my, in my essay. But I need to break it down a little more. For example, the American family in Williams' Cat Hot Tin Roof reflects a culture that uh, demands too much of individuals. To what extent do you, do you agree? Okay, I can't jump into an essay with a question like this without breaking it down a little without asking myself, what do I actually want to write? So this is where we get to something like this. Um, discuss the proposition that characters in, Sha in Shakespeare's Othello cello, um, suffer as a result of their imposed isolation. This is a sort of classic prompt. So how I would look at this is I want to kind of break this down. I want to break it down into, okay, cool. I know I need to discuss this idea, the proposition. So what that means is that this thing here, that characters suffer as a result of their imposed isolation, this, I need to discuss this idea. So, and discuss tells me I can't outright negate it, refute it. I can't outright you know, say it's true. I've got to discuss it. Now, characters, am I looking at my main characters? Am I looking at the entire cast or just my minor characters? That's the one to look at. Suffer. Okay, well, what is suffering? In a feminist perspective, my suffering might be, you know, my oppression uh, or my uh, lack of agency in a, in a patriarchal male-dominated world. Under a Marxist perspective, my suffering might be my inability to dictate, you know, where the capital goes, where the, where the money I work for goes. A psychoanalytical perspective might look at its actual, you know, emotional torment and a variety of different things. So you can see here, when I'm unpacking this, I'm using my perspective as my base and I'm answering this prompt through the perspective. Imposed is another great one to look at, like, you know, who is it being imposed by? And isolation. Are people, you know, is there, it's a text, are they physically isolated? Have they been abandoned on an island that they can't escape from? Or are they lonely? Are they in solitude or are they lonely? These are all great questions. So when I broke this one down, I broke it down like this. So discuss the proposition, 
considering the whether you agree um, or disagree with the idea presented, that characters, okay, is it our main characters, is it our, our side cast, is it, does it also extend to the characters that we might see once or twice throughout the entire text? Um, suffer as a result. So what I would do is I would often grab a thesaurus and sort of um, look at this with different definitions. So if they suffer as a result, um, are they hurt? Because they're hurt because of this, sure. But how is this failure manifested? Is, are they suffering uh, in their interactions? Are they struggling there? Is it in their psyche, the way they're thinking? Is it because they die? These are all different things. And you know, we can look at the exact same thing, but I can talk about you know, the deaths of the characters at the end, if, um, to potentially. And Asma could be talking about you know, the, the, the suffering and the fact that they might be losing friends or losing relationships. So we might be using the same perspective here and the, the same prompt, but we might still have very, very different ideas. Imposed is a sort of word that you should refer to a thesaurus to see, you know, is it self-imposed, is it imposed by others? Um, would you just, in your essay, would you discuss self, like a paragraph on self, like being self-imposed and a paragraph on being imposed by others? Or would you talk about one or talk about both? And isolation is a great one. Is, are they socially isolated, physically? Are they verbally? What's going on here? So my next quick activity for you all today is to have a look at something like this. This should be something that hopefully you have been doing, but if you haven't, let's get onto it straight away. But hopefully we want to be doing it in maybe a little bit more than just breaking it up. Now, I'm going to give you a, um, a prompt from an exam, and I want to see you may or may not have done this, this essay, sorry, this text. Doesn't matter. Not a huge deal. Um, what I want you to look at is the actual words, how you could apply it to your own text potentially, but what are you looking at? Um, before we jump into that, I'm just gonna to talk to you a little bit about the topic types. This is a really key point that a lot of students don't understand. This is a classic stitch up where you've been training to do um, in what ways and how it does, or rather you've been training to do, consider the extent at which, and in the exam you get a, what ways or how it does and you write an essay based on the extent of the proposition but the the question is actually asking you know tell me about how this happens so when you get something like discuss the proposition or reflect on the idea that you need to consider whether you agree with the proposition and you also have to think of exceptions so you want to write an interpretation working closely with the key ideas that proposition has presented so, and then the considering the extent to which and to what extent does, you've got to consider where your position lies in a continuum. This is a little bit more nuanced. Justify and explain why. So the proposition they're going to give you isn't going to be 100% true or 100% false, but you've got to work out where it is true and where it isn't. And your interpretation should include info from across the text. And again, this isn't like close analysis where you're giving three passages. You are expected to be analyzing from bits and bobs across the entire text all of the poems or all of the book. In what ways and how it does, you're gonna be um, looking at, there's very little room for disagreement. Like you can have stuff in disagreement, like why you disagree. Now, actually, in what ways does Williams present um, money to be a pervading factor in Cat Hot Tin Roof? Now you could disagree with that in a couple of paragraphs, but the easiest way to go about it is to maybe have a little room for disagreement, but focus on the actual question. Focus on how the literary techniques and the actual language achieves this and use the perspective to draw an inference on wider society. This is what we should be doing. Texts are often about society as a whole or ideas as a whole. That's what we're trying to glean out of it using a perspective. So I have a prompt for you here. Wright's Carpentaria shows how people's rivalries can blind them to more significant dangers. To what extent do you agree? Cool. This is a pretty interesting one. I think, and you, you could really you know, pop this with any sort of um, any sort of text, but I've used Wright Carpentaria since that was one provided. Um, but take a, a minute here, I think. Take a minute to open up the Mentimeter again and pick out a couple of words here. Is it people's rivalries? 
the extent, stuff like that. And how might you describe that? I've already got one excellent one in the Mentimeter, but we'll give you a minute or so here. Pick one word, um, pick and see what how you could expand that. So open your open your mind a little and think beyond just what's written down, how you could change that and how you could adjust that. So I'll give you a, um, just a brief minute here. Best of luck and give it a go. Alrighty, legends, great work. So you've had a, had a look and let, let's point out a couple of key points. So the things I would be looking at is shows, okay? What, what does that mean? What, what do shows mean? Is it in the, the actual story? Is it in the way the characters develop? Everything like that. Peoples, is this everybody in the world? Is Carpinteria making a, 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 um, a social commentary on the way everyone behaves? Or is it just the characters? And it's up to you. You get to write this. You get to choose which one you're looking at. What are rivalries and how are they? That's more text specific. Blind them, great one to look at. To more significant dangers, again, it's a bit more text specific. And to what extent do you agree implies that this is a true proposition and, and to how much do you believe it's true? So rivalries, and I'm taking from the Mentimeter here, might ask you to consider cultural, class, and political structures. Great. Um, and um, everything like that. Peoples could be uh, groups of people rather than individual characters. Is it, yeah, exactly. Is it a group mentality or is it the individual characters that show these, that, that have these rivalries? Um, the rivalries might be conflicts of interest, different theologies, cultural differences. Uh, and these, these are some absolutely fantastic one. And dangers could be physical dangers. Are you just going to look at the physical dangers or you have a, a paragraph about, you know, the um, harm from others and self-harm, for example, in, in your first paragraph and the second look at emotional and mental harm or look at different characters per paragraph and look at how they've experienced this. Um, this is absolutely fantastic. And more significant dangers is a bit more text specific, but someone's also put in significant dangers don't necessarily mean to oneself. It might be, might be for the preservation of everybody else. Um, it could be, you know, looking at the, da the danger to the environment, to the country and to, you know, ideology as compared to um, one's own individual um, harm and, and self-preservation, that sort of stuff. So this is absolutely fantastic work. And that's what we want you to do every time you see a prompt. What I want you to do in that 15 minutes in the reading time of the exam, I want you to read your prompt and then I want you to go to your close analysis pieces and read those for fee for section B. And when you're done with those, go back to your prompt and sort of break it down. Okay, this is pretty open. They're meant to be pretty broad to allow you to do a lot of things with them. And let's rephrase this. So we could do Wright's Carpenteria shows how the group of people in Desperance are um, and how they're, they're, they view themselves as rivals, uh, blind them to a, uh, blind them to the impact of to their community on the environment. For example, that's just pulling something out of, out of thin air. Um, but sort of rephrase it in a way that you can better answer it, as long as it's obviously stuck within the same sort of idea that the prompt has, has, has had to begin with. So break it down, rephrase it, and, and almost phrase it in a way that allows you to best tackle it with your perspective. But legendary work so far. 
So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a brief break. I'm going to show you a quick video from, uh, uh, from Skyline and we'll have a look at this and then we'll um, jump in to a, a quick break before we, we finish up with literary perspectives. Hey guys, my name's Saskia and I'm one of the maths tutors at Skyline Hatch. So this revision series I'll be taking SPESH 3-4. So we're going through all of the main like topics on the study design for SPESH, including like probability, calculus, vectors, etc. So we'll go through all of the content as well as a bunch of exam questions um, and like exam tips um, and strategies to get you guys through the exam. Awesome. So if you're doing SPESH and you haven't had a chance to sign up for tomorrow's session yet, go ahead and do that. So what we're gonna do now, quite briefly, is we're gonna have a bit of a break. We're gonna do about six minutes of break. We'll jump back in at three o'clock, we're getting started. So set that alarm on your phone, but grab a glass of water, have a bit of a stretch, uh, move around a little. We've been going for an hour right now. It's been so fast, um, but yeah, have a, have a bit of a, grab a glass of water, have a stretch, everything like that. And we'll meet you back here at 3 p.m. to get started again. See you in five minutes, legends.
Alrighty, legends, let's jump into it. Just a reminder, you can pop all your Q&A questions into the Mentimeter whenever you would like, and we're going to get to those shortly. Before we begin, I'm just going to show you another quick video from Skyline, and we'll jump into some more content. Hey, my name is Theano and I will be leading the psychology exam revision session where we will go through all of the points in the study design, teach you tips and tricks on how to answer questions effectively to get full marks and help you ace the exam this year. The exam revision series is a perfect opportunity to see everything you need to know about the exam, make sure that you know everything and you don't have any gaps in knowledge and ask questions to recent graduates who will also set the same exam as you will be. I am currently studying psychology and I really love it because it answers the questions of why and how do different processes happen in our life. For example, um, how does memory work, how does learning work, um, which is what we will be going through in the exam revision series. A study tip for me, which I am still doing with all my learning objectives, would be to get all the points from the study design and use them in your note taking when you are revising for the exam, just to make sure that you know everything. Highlight the important aspects and the key um, and the key words, and then go underneath and just write all your notes. And yeah, just make sure that you're familiar with everything. Because the study design really is um, very important for you. Thank you for watching. Um, we're very excited to see you in the VC exam revision series this year with Skyline Hatch. Awesome stuff. So we have um, a special and psychology coming up um, soon. Awesome. So look, we're going to jump straight into things. Cool. We've talked a little bit about prompts. We've talked a little bit about perspectives. But you might be thinking to yourself, Josh, like, sure. Like, but how do I, how do I do it? So when I was in year 12, I would sort of roughly use this method that I now call the four C's. Now I, I had to, uh, I went to this, this, this summer school um, for rural kids and they taught me something similar and I've heard from different teachers. And this is, you might have your own way of doing things. This is a way I would do things personally. The four C stand for close analysis, criticism, critique, and conclude. So this isn't, when I say close analysis, I'm not talking about section B, I'm still talking about the true perspectives. But when I say close analysis, I'm talking about textual detail, looking at actual detail from the text, be it the quote, be it an idea, be it a, a theme, um, and starting off with that. So I would always start off with you know, a quote or an idea and analyze that. And then I would link that in to my perspectives, to my literary criticism. The criticism is my perspective. Through my critique, I would then evaluate, you know, how relevant uh, my criticism is. And I would then conclude by linking that back to the prompt that we were talking about. And this would all happen over, you know, two to four sentences. I might do a sentence for each. I might do a sentence for close analysis and then a sentence for criticism and, and linking that to its relevance and then another sentence to wrap that in to the prompt. Now I'll show you a few examples. But first things first, in the shirt you don't need a specific um, structure. I had friends in high school who wrote 20 paragraphs per essay and these paragraphs might have been, you know, only four sentences long and I had friends who wrote two paragraphs for the entire essay. Now I'm going to be a bit less contrarian. I'm going to say it's good to do an intro, good to do a conclusion, good to do three paragraphs. But you, these don't need to be the same size. They don't need to be in the same detail or anything like that. So I would recommend an introduction for your literary perspectives. I would recommend an introduction to establish your perspective. The examiner gets about three minutes to read your essay. And you don't want to leave them to the second last paragraph. So they think, and then they think, oh, they're using a feminist perspective or, oh, they're using a Marxist perspective. You don't want to leave it till then. You want to tell them straight away. It was actually one of the questions in the Q&A is, will I get marked down for explaining my perspective, in, uh, explaining what my perspective is? I'm not an examiner. I don't know, but I wouldn't think so. I've never heard of anything like that. Um, it, it, some of the more high scoring essays won't say anything because but that's that's not because a high scoring essay doesn't include it. 
that it's a very common uh, fallacy that people think, oh, the high scoring essays don't say that they're using a feminist perspective. Therefore, in order for me to be high scoring, I shouldn't say I'm using feminist perspective. The reason why they're high scoring is because they have all the language and the terminology and everything like that uh, related to their perspective in from the very first sentence, the very first word. And because of that, they don't need the feminist perspective. They don't need to say, I'm using a feminist perspective or I'm using a Marxist perspective. Um, so a high scoring essay isn't high scoring because it doesn't include what the perspective is. It's high scoring because it does the perspective very well. In your intro, I personally would avoid in-depth analysis, but I would talk about key events uh, to justify my interpretation and support my knowledge of the text. I'd be telling the, the, the examiner, I know what I'm talking about, and I'd be kind of hinting or foreshadowing my overall ideas. You need to reference views and values, the key themes of the prompt, the, the vocab from the lens, and your overall interpretation. So, for example, I've taken this from a practical exam I wrote, and why I'm using this is a bit, bit more uh, Barry Child is on the study design still, but it's less common. So I figured I'd just use this one because it's, it's, it jumps straight into things. But be, the, the prompt was, Barry Child confronts the issue that for all characters, there's a conflict for truth, between truth and illusion. What view does the play present about this conflict? Cool. So it's told me a couple of things. It's told me that there's a conflict. I've got to discuss that. All characters. It hasn't just said characters. It said all characters. So I've got to make sure to reference that. And what view does the play not, not the text, not, not the script, the actual play itself. So I should be making sure to reference you know, stagecraft and that sort of stuff. So I've jumped in with a consideration into the real and the fabricated, and the fabricated is integral to understanding the postmodern wasteland of Sam Shepard's 1978 buried child. So I've highlighted straight away, I'm talking about postmodernism, the one of the perspectives that I used. Indeed, as the postmodern condition gives voice to the dissonance and equivocality that plagues every facet of the play's existence, its deconstruction of the demise of the middle American agricultural family seeks to subvert the very fabric of reality as it exposes a grander narrative. The grand narrative of the American dream is fallacious and unrealistic. Okay, a lot to deal with there. I don't want you to be looking at the words and be like, what is he talking about? I want you to look at how I've structured it. So I've said, I've, I, I've talked about um, the text itself. So how the text, the close analysis, so looking at the consideration to real and fabricated and how that's integral to the thing, to the, to the, to the text. So I'm looking at a theme or an idea in the text. I then move on to my criticism. My criticism talks about dissonance and equivocality. This is lack of meaning. And that shows it's everywhere in the place existence. Uh, so I changed my color up for that one, actually. So this is my criticism. I then move on to my critique. My critique kind of tells me about, um, my critique kind of links it all together, links the, um, the what I've been talking about back to the perspective and, and how it's relevant. Um, so I've talked about the perspective and, and I've shown that because the perspective illustrates a deconstruction of the middle American agricultural family, um, therefore it's linked to the fact that the grand narrative of the American dream is, is wrong. And finally, I've gone to my conclude, linking that to maybe the prompt into the wider world. As the borders between what is real and what is not become increasingly blurred, which is a link back to what I've previously said, Shepard demonstrates the conflict that exists between the two is inescapable. And this is a views and values. It's saying that across the world, across time, the conflict between what is real and what's not, we can't escape from. So again, I've done my close analysis. I've looked at maybe a theme or an idea or a quote from my text, linked that to a perspective and linked that perspective to the relevance, why it's important to know. And then I've gone to my conclusion, not, not a paragraph conclusion, but concluding that idea so that I can then move on to my next idea. So your body paragraphs should be um, centered around an aspect or a theme of the text. Your body paragraph shouldn't be random ideas thrown together. It should have one cohesive narrative between all of them and between each individual one. So you need to be engaging in in-depth analysis to substantiate your interpretation. If your interpretation is incredible, awesome. If it has tech, if it has actual links, that's how you get the marks. For example, I can sit here and I can say, Harry Potter is about um, aliens invading Earth. Now, I'm sure I could find one or two quotes from the text uh, that substantiate that, but I think we'd all agree that it's definitely not about aliens invading. 
But I could say that Harry Potter is about the fantastic and magical world children create after feelings of abandonment or, or loss. That's not might not exactly be what it's about, but that's an interpretation that I can get a lot of evidence for. And that's great because I can then include that evidence in my essay. You also want to be critiquing your ideas. An essay requires nuance. So discuss both sides of your argument, even if your conclusion lends you, leads you to sway a particular way. This was also a question that was raised in the Q&A, which I'll briefly read out for you. Two birds, one stone. Um, with a feminist perspective, you see female power, but you also might see female oppression. Can you talk about both? Yes, please do. That's how you get those marks. Critique your own ideas. Your conclusion might say, in fact, even though there is uh, female empowerment shown in the text, overall, there's still a culture of oppression. Sure, you can say that. But you've looked at both of them, which really helps substantiate what you've been saying. And reference to a wide variety of things. So, for example, in this one where I've got the stage directions and silences and buried child are just as telling of the dialogue. This was a really crazy prompt to deal with, and I'd encourage you to look at some more, more strange ones. So Shepard draws from a colourful tapestry of mythology, as varied as the Oedipal myth to legend of, Os of Osiris. So here again, I've done my close analysis. I've said, this is what the author has done. Indeed, it is the childish regression of Vince doing what he used to do at the dinner table. Cool, I've included uh, evidence. So this again is my close analysis. And the British assembly of himself presented crashing through the screen porch door that embodies the moribund trope, the, the moribund, trope of moribund homecoming from Mythos's archaic of Legend of Ages. Again, don't stress about what the words I'm using. This is just related to my criticism, to my literary perspective. As Shepard's pastiche acts as a vessel to illustrate the construction of one subjective truth over another, and there I'm linking here some of the, the ideas I've talked about, I'm linking that to the overall ideas I'm talking about my essay. That's my, criti that's my critique. That's my going back, that's my third C, going back and linking things together. The shocking imagery of the silent corpse of a small child ultimately delineates an abhorrent legacy of incest and infanticide that inevitably accompanies the crumbling of the grand narrative of the American dream. Again, a lot of your texts are going to be quite heavy, but that doesn't mean you can't draw new conclusions from them. So here I've linked that with my conclusion and shown that how that illustrates the crumbling of the American dream, the wider thing I'm looking at. My text never states the American dream. It never talks about it. But this is a big idea that I'm looking at, the big idea that I'm trying to then link back to the prompt. And finally, our conclusion. So your conclusion, I would recommend doing one uh, for your literary perspectives. Your conclusion to summarise your analysis, you know, remind the reader what they're reading. Make links to important parts of the text, especially the ending. I would always try and link to the ending. And strengthen your connection to the text's wider meaning. So, so Take a step back, stop looking at the micro, look at the macro, look at what's actually going on. But make sure by the end, you have actually answered the question the prompt poses. The prompt poses. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I'm a little scatterbrained. And I start writing and I'm like, oh, this is a cool idea. And this is a cool idea. And I get to, I get to the end of my essay and I'm like, oh my goodness, I've gone completely off track. Make sure you're not doing that. Make sure that's why the 4C model, where you're constantly checking back in on yourself, keeps you doing the right thing. So, for example, here, as the lights go to black at the play's finish symbolizes the end of another day for the sun to rise again and the trauma to repeat itself. Cool. There's my close analysis again. Shepard's message of the inescapability of the conflict between truth and fabrication is conjured in the cyclic ending of the chronology. That Vince sees his face becoming his father's face symbolizes a never ending cycle in which the family are trapped. So, here I've linked to my perspective. And I've linked to my prompt, but I've gone back to a bit more close analysis. So this 4Cs model doesn't need to be you know, static. You can change it up a bit if you'd like, but it's making sure you tick all of those things off. Um, but also in referencing that again, I've also shown how that is linked to the perspective I'm using. The postmodern wasteland of Sam Shepard's deconstruction of the American dream presents a depressing reality. Humanity perpetually surrounds itself with false narratives, and thus the conflict between the real and envisioned is never truly inescapable. 
And here, this, this is like the, the, the big ending, the mic drop. I've linked to the, the actual prompt itself, but I've also linked to the wider world. I haven't talked about just the play. I've talked about what this means for us. Um, and that uh, in the context of the perspective. That is, I guess, and I'm not trying to say that this is the best thing you possibly could do. There's many, many better ways you could do this. I'm going to use, I use my examples because I'm more familiar with them. Um, but the sort of, this is the sort of level you want to, want to be at where you're referencing all these things. You're referencing your criticism, your perspective, you're referencing your prompt, and you're linking that to the wider world, definitively answering the question. Awesome stuff. So, this brings us to one last quick attempt. Um, so we got we got a passage here. Use the following passage to help inform an interpretation of the given prompt through a literary perspective of your choice. Again, you may not have done this. This is no longer so design, but I, I want you to kind of have a look and look at the same thing we we're doing earlier, looking at the perspective, but trying to link that in to a prompt. So instead of just looking at a thing and saying, yeah, that links to a feminist perspective or Marxist perspective because of X, Y, Z, talk about how it links and therefore how does it relate to the prompt. So the prompt here is that the text uh, reflects a culture that demands too much of individuals. And I'll read through the, the, the stage directions. Brick is still on the gallery. Someone calls up to him in a, in a warm voice. Hi, Mr. Brick, how are you feeling? Brick raises his liquor glass as if that answered the question. Margaret, you can be young without money, but you can't be old without it. You've got to be old with money because to be old without it is just too awful and got to be one or the other. If you're young with money, you can't be old and without it. That's the truth, Brick. Brick whistles softly, vaguely. Well, I'm dressed. Now I'm dressed. I'm all dressed. There's nothing else for me to do. Forlornly, almost fearfully. I'm dressed, all dressed, nothing else for me to do. She moves restlessly, aimlessly, and speaks as if to herself. I know when I made my mistake. What am I? Oh, my bracelets. She starts working a collection of bracelets over her hands to her wrists, about six on each, as she talks. Interesting. Is it, and I think a Marxist and feminist perspective are both quite useful here, but use whatever you want. So grab a bit of info from the text and see if you can do something that I did earlier, where you look at that info, you link it to a perspective and explain how that links to demanding too much of individuals. So again, as we're now going to give you a couple of minutes here to have a look, give it a go. The Mentimeter is now open for you to have, have a look at. This doesn't need to be too detailed. It could be three dot points, three words, whatever you want. But we want to, I want you to get your brains working, get you energized and active. We'll jump into some Q&A after this, but take a couple of minutes just to try break something down. Grab your close analysis through your lens of, the, of your perspective and link that to a prompt. Alrighty, a couple of minutes here, legends. Best of luck, give it a go.
Alrighty, legends. There's some great stuff here. And again, we've this is the clash that happens every year. Make sure you're looking at, you're not giving up too much of your perspective. You're not kind of letting your perspective like leave while you look at the prompt. At the same time, make sure you reflect back on the prompt when you're using your perspective. But these are all incredible. So a couple of key ideas for the feminist perspective might be how, you know, looking at it from the close analysis sort of view, Maggie views that, you know, she's dressed, I'm all dressed, nothing else for me to do. The role of a woman is to be dressed and, and that's it. And then what breaks it out of that spell is, oh, my bracelet, she's forgotten something that, that um, adds to her femininity. Well, how does that link? Well, obviously, she's a smart person. We've got this whole the monologue here about, you know, she understands how the world works. And yet the American family and, and the culture in, in this text shows that um, she needs to, well, they de it demands for her to be just a woman. That's all she's she's asked to be and all she can be. That's how I would personally think that. A lot of people picked up on the Marxist response as well, which is awesome. And there's two really good points here. Rick doesn't respond to someone who is of a lower class, and that's shown by the use of um, colloquial sort of more casual language, language that it's, it, it's shown in the stage directions to be, you know, Mr. Haya, how you're feeling. That's like that, that sort of language that's not as formal. There's a class difference there. Brooke doesn't even acknowledge it, doesn't even acknowledge a person speaking to him. And at the same time, the, 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 um, the, um, the person below doesn't even reference Maggie. So we can also reference that in a, in a, um, in a feminist perspective in that, you know, even as a woman of the house, Maggie isn't afforded any recognition. The other thing that people picked up on is, oh, my bracelets. Maggie feels complete by a show of wealth. Having six bracelets on each arm, that's pretty impressive. And that's pretty, pretty over the top, I think. And that's illustrative of, of this wealth that um, she can only, she needs to be completed by the show of capital. And again, we link that in here in order, and you can link it in obviously with this monologue, in order to be a successful person, the American family has demanded that she must display her wealth in an obvious way, despite the fact she obviously doesn't want to. This is not the first thing on her mind. Um, but there has been some great stuff in here and I'm happy to go through a couple, but they're, they're all incredible. So I'm not going to, you know, sit here and, and go through every single one because we'll be here for hours and hours talking about how great they are. But again, this is fantastic. Looking at, um, again, um, m manufacturing worldly things for survival in a much perspective. The bracelets are required for her survival or even how um being financially stable at a certain age due to societal societal expectations therefore you're expected to be financially stable expected to be rich by a certain age because there's no point in living if you're old and poor um and that is the culture that's being demanded by the play great work legends so look i'm going to take you through what some people wrote and how they actually wrote this for the exam reports um, this is an introduction here and it gives us an overview, but doesn't explicitly say what perspective is used. And this is what I talked about earlier. So as Maggie becomes a lively cat in a hot tin roof, William portrays the suffering confines of female existence within the rigid walls of this 1950s patriarchy. Now, now straight away, I can tell this is going to be a feminist perspective. I haven't said feminist perspective, but if you're going to choose and you're going to opt out of announcing a perspective, you need a sentence like this, a sentence that tells the examiner exactly what you're going to be talking about. This is a post-war society that upholds the notion of conformity as a way of information stability. So this is a sort of interpretation they're trying to get at. Yet in doing so, the world of the play becomes swarmed by broken facades. Um, those innovating uh, demands leave a character like Brick crippled and, emo and emotionally intransigent. With that said, however, the spectral presence of a tenderness which was uncommon subtly alludes for the potential for genuine love to allow the characters to usurp and survive the demanding expectations of society. This is a pretty good intro. This it, it links to textual evidence and it tells me like, look, they're gonna obviously be talking about um, the conformity and these broken facades and how these broken facades, the expectations leave people crippled and you know, emotionally devastated. But their interpretation is going to say, they've told me, that 
there is evidence that shows that people can break past these um, break past these barriers. This is a really great intro. Looking at a um, a more of a uh, body paragraph here, it's from this. This is from the same essay. They roughly emulate the four C's approach. So they look at uh, this, and I'll go through. The figure of brick appears to the audience as a paragon of the all-American athlete. Yet the cool air of detachment that masks the violent, the violent and jarring flashes of lightning exposes a fragile and vulnerable pretense of de detached ability he offers. So here, cool, great. We've looked at a bit of, let me change my color up. We've looked at a bit of close analysis and kind of starting to link that into a perspective. As Williams makes clear, this is a man whose society crowned with an early lull. A society seemingly cultivated around the strong heterosexual man, given how the American foot, so foot soldier emerged as a cultural icon of resilience. Cool. So they're also linking to their uh, perspective of, you know, this idea of the strong heterosexual man, the hegemonic male, and then critiquing that in showing why that's relevant. It's relevant because the American foot soldier is an icon of resilience. And yet going wider in, in concluding, Yet in the examination of Brick's potentially ambiguous sexuality across the play, the existence of something perhaps not normal in the words of the system of mendacity in doing so, forcing the extinction of familial ties and rendering characters combative. So it doesn't finish there, the paragraph goes on, but this sentence here kind of links us in to the wider views and the wider ideas that they kind of discussed in the intro. So you'll note here a few things, they, they reference you know, cultural ideas. They reference ideas from the time. This is great. This is views and values. Um, they also use quotes to provide, to provide textual evidence. So they examine the quotes, but they also use quotes as evidence. This is really important. It tells the examiner you know what you're talking about. Great, awesome stuff. That's sort of the level that Joe is a very, very high level. But I think what you should be doing is taking inspiration from this. How have they structured their essay and how have they best, you know, um, explained their concepts? They've gone through and they've actually done it quite systematically. They've gone through with evidence, linking that to their perspective, critiquing that and coming in and linking that overall to the prompt itself. That's really important. All right. So now we're going to do a couple of minutes of a Q&A. So we've got a couple of questions here and you're able to, like, a thumbs up each question that's appeared on the Mentimeter in the Q&A section, if you want that question to be answered more. And that comes up in order of the, the most liked questions. So our first question for Asma and I are, how long, so it is, how long did you spend planning on your exam? Great question. Asma, I don't know if you remember, but I'll, I'll pass over to you for this one. Sure. So that was how long have have you been like planning for the exam? Was that it? Oh, well, I, I think what it's asking is during the exam, how much time did you spend oh, planning your planning time? Okay, so not before that. Um, so planning time, I think, um, I spent about like I spent quite a lot of time on planning just because I like to have a solid idea of what I'm doing, um, before I start writing. So I'd say maybe six to seven minutes, um maybe less depending I can't, I can't remember honestly how long I spent no, it's, yeah it's a long time but I think if I had a clear idea of what I was writing maybe like literally a few minutes like four minutes and if I didn't wasn't too sure I needed more of a solid idea I'd say up to like maybe six minutes um yeah totally totally yeah no great um personally I in my reading time I would have read my prompt and I would have come up with an idea of my interpretation with I like doing poetry in close analysis because there's only so many poems they could ask, whereas with, with a book they can ask like any random passage. So I had a pretty good idea already of what I would do when I had given which poems I had. And I could kind of build towards it. In in English mainstream, you need a idea and then you can talk about it. And this shows a bit more leeway. Like you, you want to have your idea locked in your head before you start writing. Don't get me wrong. But if you don't, like I almost imagine it like you're trying to cross a river. Each paragraph, each bit of analysis is you, you, you throwing a stone into the river. And eventually you're going to be able to get across the river to, um, to, to answer your question. Um, the, other, the other analogy, and I, I only have very bad analogies, is like literature is like making a cake. In English, you need to have the cake ready by your first, by your introduction to show the uh, examiner what you're talking about. In literature, it's more about 
hey, I'm going to be making a cake in my in your introduction, but then saying, Joe, so your your first paragraph for the eggs and the flour, your second paragraph is everything else, et cetera, et cetera. And your conclusion is that presentation of the cake. You can get away with a lot more if you haven't got a very firm idea. That being said, hopefully you will. I personally would recommend um, spending, you know, five minutes before each section. You've got two hours, so an hour per essay. Spend five to 10 minutes for each section planning. Really making sure I would write down all of the quotes I was going to be using because my brain would just forget them in times of stress um, for, for section A. And kind of doing a brief bit of a plan, not spelling everything out, but saying, cool, this paragraph I'm going to focus on brick and um, the ambiguous sexuality. And this paragraph I'm going to focus on Maggie and her role as a woman in this all-American family, ETC, ETC. Uh, but that's a great question. I think, you know, it, whatever works for you, I, I, they, they, like with, unlike chemistry, and I just did the chemistry revision lecture, I can tell you the best and quickest way to answer every question. Literature, I can't. It's so unique. What I would do is I would spend some time doing practice exams. Your first practice exam, set aside 10 minutes before each essay to do a full on plan. Second one, spend no time or maybe one minute doing trying to do a plan and see what works best. Try with different times, try with different strategies, see what works best for you. Alrighty, when writing a section A essay, do we have to specifically refer to the theorists? Um, you don't have to quote a theorist. In fact, many students don't quote a theorist. If you want to quote a theorist, fantastic, but you've got to make sure all of the ideas you present are your own, inspired by the theory. You're not ripping off someone else's work. So you definitely don't have to quote a theorist. I can tell you I didn't quote any theorists in mine. For you, was each of your practice essays a completely new essay with different ideas or quotes, or did you prepare a base essay to work with? This is an interesting question. So, so I, what, what I want you to think about is, is you have an interpretation of your text, right? You can use that to build an essay from. I would never suggest writing a base essay and like, and then you can able to add stuff in about the, the prompt. That doesn't work. Your conclusion interpretation should be linked to your prompt. It's not hey, here's my interpretation and there's some bits about the prompt. Your interpretation at the end should be intertwined with your prompt. That, that, that's the point here. But you can, you can have ideas ready to go for that. With close analysis, I knew that I was either going to be talking about the beauty of art for this set of poetry I was doing or uh, how uh, people, um, uh, how the real world isn't as glamorous as we present it. Um, I would talk about one of those two things, depending on the poems that I got. Cool, I got poem one, seven, and 12. Great, I'm talking about art. I got poem two, seven, and six. Cool, I'm going to be talking about um, the glamorous nature of the world, etc., etc. Asma, again, I don't know if you remember what you would do, but uh, do you have any insights here? Yeah, I don't think I would do a base essay at all because you're like, you can have your base ideas, but a base essay, I feel like it, it might also come across as like, too like um scripted kind of like the examiners when they're looking at it so definitely wouldn't recommend doing that just have your you know solid ideas and your um yeah interpretations of things um but yeah when you're doing it don't write what you remember off a base essay awesome awesome um so people have asked for the slides we've popped that in chat already you're able to access that um and you're also able to access the recordings um cool how do you prepare for the exam now i've got a little section of that at the end so we might leave that till then um do you is it good to think of the exam like a conversation of your ideas to the examiner yeah, yeah like you want to be presenting your examiner with your ideas i wouldn't say hey mate how are you going here's my ideas please give me a 20 out of 20 no you want to write a formal essay. If, if, if it helps for you to, I would think, like how I would write is like someone else is going to read this, right? This is an essay for you. And actually, I think this touched on a very good point. Like the issue I would have is I would do such in-depth writing of my, of my text and each essay I would try to get more and more complicated. But it got to the end where my practice essays were, uh, in my opinion, the interpretations were fantastic, but it relied on a lot of information that 
a casual reader wouldn't know about the text. And I just, because I'd written about it so much, I just assumed my teacher knew about it. So they were like, yeah, that's cool. But your examiner, you've got to assume your examiner, or your examiner will be an expert in the text, but you can't not explain like key ideas from the postmodern perspective, for example, um, just because you know them. So in terms of a conversation with the examiner, I wouldn't phrase it as such, but you should be spelling everything out, remember? You aren't the one marking yourself. You know all of your ideas. You know where your idea, where your interpretation has come from. The examiner, you need to explain that to them. So yeah, sure, if you're writing an interpretation, you can always phrase it as a way of explaining the interpretation. That's what your essay should be. But it's not like a, this is what I think here, this is what I think here, this is what I, what I think here. A little different from that. Uh, will we get marked down in section A if we explicitly state the lens we're doing? Again, I've gone over this. I don't think you will, and I think it's probably best practice to as well. How would you allocate the time spent on each section of the exam? Aspen, did you do an hour and an hour? Do you remember? Um, I don't believe I did an hour on both. I think I spent more time on the close analysis um, because personally when I, I just looked at the more difficult one and for me, doing it with the close analysis was slightly more difficult. So I definitely spent more time on that. Um, I think, yeah, and if you, the strong, the section that you feel more stronger in, you probably will end up spending less time on. Um, so you don't have to do a strict hour on both. Yeah, totally. Like the, the thing I will caution against is, um, I mean, my chemistry exam, I got my timings wrong. I thought I was an hour ahead of everything. And I, I got to the, to the end and I was like, cool, I'm done. And then it was like, 3.15 and the clock ticked for 3.16. I'm looking around and I'm like, hey, we're finishing up. And I got 3.17. And I'm like, oh my goodness, my exam finishes at 4.15. <laughs> and I just rushed through this and I had to, and that long answer I had to go through and I had to rewrite it and all this stuff because I'd done it too rushed. So I wouldn't say do like half an hour and an hour and a half. Um, but I would say, you know, once you finish your first, like set a time limit for yourself, if you think, you find them both equally hard, an hour and an hour. If you think you find one hard and the other, maybe do 50 minutes and 70 or 45 and 75. Um, but make sure you're, you're sticking to that time limit and once you're done, you're done. You know, because you don't want to spend, say, oh, I find close analysis harder, so I spend an hour and, hour and 15, and then you spend an hour on uh, perspectives and you read over it and you start freaking out and you only get half an hour left for um, close analysis, you don't want to be doing that. But these are some great questions. So what are we going to do? And again, question about access to recording. So we have gone over this. Um, you have access to the recording and the slides. Keep an eye on your inbox and the slides are going to be in chat. Um, so that's all, that, that's all there. We're going to be doing some more Q&A at the end of today's session. Um, so what we're going to do right now is we're going to move on to everyone's favorite close analysis. So let's start off with the basics, language techniques. So Close analysis is about language. Uh, and a lot of students, but I say this and people say, yeah, I know. A lot of students don't understand. <clears throat> Your entire interpretation is about what the language is doing and how that leads to an overall idea. Language analysis should incorporate multiple tiers of meta language to inform a substantive interpretation of a text. You've got to remember that when you're reading a play, you're not analyzing your reading of it you're analyzing what the play would be like if it was performed in front of you. When you're reading poetry, you're not analyzing it. You shouldn't be analyzing it in what it just says. You've got to be looking at how it's going to sound, the tone, the pace, the cadence. Um, it's going to be very, very different from when you read in your head, like, you know, um, twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble. There's twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble. ETC, ETC. That was an excerpt from the Jabberwock. It's the only poem I know of my heart. Um, but just as an example there. So I like to divide it into three different sections. And again, this is all my ideas. I'm not saying this is the way you need to do things. This is the way that's best. I'm trying to tell you about the mechanisms I use that really help me boost my score and boost my understanding. So I would look at language and I would say, okay, cool. We've got technical language. And that's how the text is actually written. Like the actual construction, this could be the syntax. To an extent, it could be, you know, the um, the the way it's it's like actually written down. There's the similes, the metaphors, stuff like that. You've also got your melodic language features, how it sounds, 
This is the rhyme scheme, the tempo, the, the cadence, even in a written book, the way words, like the way words are actually done, like um, like soft and, and sneaky is very different to like something more guttural and plosive, like, um, I don't know, like, I can't think of an example I, right now, but I've got a few in a bit. Um, and also structural features, how the text is designed. Is it first person? Is it third person? Where is it set? Who is it through the perspective of? Um, is it a play? How is a play written? Oh, it's a poem. Well, how is that poem structured? And every section of analysis or every paragraph, I try to use at least one of these because it shows that I'm not just looking at what's written. I'm not just looking at how it sounds and I'm not just looking at how it's designed. I'm looking at this text holistically. Every aspect of his existence is informing my interpretation. So my interpretation might be you're pretty mediocre and that's fine, but I have used all of the evidence available to me to come up with that interpretation. It doesn't have to be a unique interpretation, but a unique interp a, a, a sorry, a pretty normal interpretation using so, so much evidence, using every facet of the, of the, the text existence is going to score and you're going to perform much, much better than someone who's got a really complex interpretation who only relies on the rhyme scheme. They haven't looked at anything else. They've just looked at the rhyme scheme. They haven't looked at the actual language that's, that we have to analyze. So we're not going to spend three minutes here, but what we're going to do is I'm going to get you to put a language technique into the, um, into the ment into Mentimeter and give me a little sentence on how that might make you feel or, or what it does to the reader. So think of a language technique. How does that make you feel or how do, what does it do? For example, um, a metaphor might, you know, reduce something down to make it more under, uh, make it more understandable for the um, for the reader, or um, a silence in the stage in a, in a play might make you look at the physical staging of the characters or, or the set of the play, for example. So one minute here, quite briefly, pop something into the uh, into the Mentimeter, give it a go. Awesome. So we've got some incredible ideas here. So people have used some great ones. Personification, it makes something more real. A seizure, a pause, emphasizes an idea. If I stop right now, you're going to be thinking about what I just said, right? Um, a perfect rhyme works really well, but an imperfect rhyme makes you, it makes it jarred and jagged, stuff like that. Um, these are all great ideas and, and think about some of these pieces of meta language and these ideas. And the thing I want you to focus on is you don't necessarily need to be able to name every sort of language technique. The examination isn't a test on who knows the most language techniques, who can identify the most. It's, it's an examination on how you analyze language. So using these is great, um, but you don't need to be using them for every single bit of language analysis. So moving on to our next the next activity to get us warmed up and pumped and pumped for uh, close analysis. I've got three excerpts for you. First is a poem by Charles Bukowski. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too tough for him. I say, stay in there. I'm not going to let anybody see you. Notice the every time we go on to a new um, a new line, that's a form of punctuation. What does it do? What does it tell us? What does it make us focus on? From the Great Gatsby, you can tell it's. It, I do quite like. I don't quite like that book. Um, 
In his blue gardens, men and girls came and went like moths among the whispering and the champagne and the stars. And finally, from Charles Dickens, Dombey and Son, there were frowsy fields and cow houses and dung hills and dust heaps and ditches and gardens and summer houses and carpet beating grounds at the very door of the railway. So we're going to spend, again, another couple of minutes here, grab a bit of info from one of these excerpts, be any of them, and tell me, okay, what does the, say, metaphor or the simile or the pause or whatever it is, what does it do? So we normally we just want to think about, okay, what is it saying? How does it make the reader feel? What does it do? And how does that make you as the reader feel? What does it tell you about the world and the text? For example, I'm, I'm going to give you one. It's just going to be one. Um, the idea that men and girls came and went like moths. Well, the simile, like moths, shows me that they're insects. The, 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 their, their attention is flickering, right? They're jumping from spot to spot. Cool, that's my analysis. But what does it tell me? It tells me that the narrator does not view these people very highly. If someone came up to you and said, hey, mate, you're a bit of a moth, you'd be pretty offended. It's not a nice way to describe people. So looking at beyond just what the language says, what does it mean? So in the simile, like moths, the narrator describes men and girls as having flickering attention and being drawn from place to place, place to place, exemplifying a very reductive and offensive um, or demeaning description of the other party goers, for example. That's a great way to start it. So pick out one of these ideas or one of these points in one of these passages and tell me a little bit about it. So again, we've got about two minutes here to give it a go. Let's see what you think. Alrighty, legends, awesome work. So we've got a couple of points here. This is, and I'll go through some examples people have raised and we'll talk about, you know, what we're doing. First one I've got here, the sibilance of the whispering or sibilance accentuates the whispering, revealing something more profound to the reader. So you could even go something like the sibilance of the whispering and the champagne and the stars imbues them all with a fantastic or, or a magical quality that illustrates their equal importance to the, to the reader. In this party, the whispering conversations and the champagne that's flowing and the wider picture, the stars and the night sky, these are all as important. 
the uh, the juxtaposition of the dullness, the color and dullness of blue in the blue gardens and the the brown of moths. Um, that this is a great one. So this uh, the person who submitted this is saying that um, there's a juxtaposition in the brightness of the blue gardens and the brown color associated with moths, illustrating that the narrator views the wonder of Gatsby's gardens as compared to the and and it views them quite well and use them as, as quite a, a powerful thing um, as compared to the people who he describes as men and girls, which is quite dismissive, um, as, as moths, which shows that they're not important to this story. It is the gardens, it is the setting that has this importance. Another great one. We've got one from Bluebird. In Bukowski's Bluebird, the titular Bluebird, meaning like the, the that is referenced to, is constricted both metaphorically and metrically as a poem's lineation draws tighter and tighter, ending on the monosyllabic U. This is great, right? This is fantastic. So what they're saying here is, you know, in the story, the bluebird is trapped, but also in the rhyme scheme. They're referencing these two points here. This is fantastic. And you can see the rhyme scheme starts to slow. I, I say, stay in there, I'm not going. That's a line. To let anybody see, you. The amount of words we can fit in a line, or the amount of ideas we can fit in a line, gets smaller and smaller. It's like we're being caged, just as the bluebird is. This is a really great point. Look at what is being said, and does the actual structure of the poem, of the text, represent that? In this case, it does. Um, this is fantastic. Um, This is a great one. So someone said that we look at the word V, the champagne and the stars, again, stressing their importance, their reference, but there's no V for men and girls. It's just men and girls who are quote like moths. And again, contributing to this idea that it's the wonder of the place, not the people. Um, awesome. Let I was trying. Oh, and I finally got one. Uh, another one we've got here about the polysyndeton of this last one here from Dickens. There were frowsy fields and cow houses and dung hills and dust heaps. This is called a polysyndeton. They didn't know too much about it, but it's just rep repeated and 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 and. If I was to say something like, I went to the shops and then I went to the doctors and then I went to the park and then I went home. It's quite a drawn out thing. But if I said, I went to the doctors, the shops, so I went to the shops, the doctors, the park at home, it's much quicker. It's much more bang, 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 you know? The polysyndeton draws out what I'm saying. And it show it, it almost showcases this very boring, very monotonous landscape. And the polysyndeton is forcing the reader to slow down when they're reading it. Just as the passage to the very door of the railway for our narrator is quite slow. Some of these are absolutely incredible. Really well done um, to all of you. All right. So if we're looking at going into a bit more detail, technical language. So if we analyze how a passage is written beyond what's superficial and obvious, we can get a good indication of what the author has consciously or not placed emphasis on. So our technical language can include repetition, metaphor, seizure, syntax, connotation, everything like this. And for example, repetition might be drawing the reader to focus on a specific moment, differs from repetition contributing to an atmosphere of unease and referencing common themes in the text. So you can have repetition that might be creepy and scary, but other repetition might, fo might force the reader to go back and look, keep looking at an idea. It's often used in horror, right? In horror novels, it wouldn't be very good if, if the, the author just let you read on, read on, and read on. They want you back in the scary part. So when talking about horror and the very structure of the text, the horror is the structure, it's meant to be scary, the language, the technical language should illustrate that as well. And that's a really good point and what someone did earlier in the, um, in the examples, taking a piece of technical language and a piece of structural language and drawing them together. Melodic language, well, how poetry, how a script, how a dialogue is read, can dramatically change how they're understood. So melody, rhythm, and rhyme scheme can contribute to emotion. You see, I'm putting a lot of emphasis on my words because like, I'm presenting. Um, but when you read it in your head, if, or if I had a script here and I read it in my head, I wouldn't be speaking like this. That's why I really recommend for close analysis, try and read it out aloud. 
Melodic language must also be considered. It's a phonology, the, the way the words sound, stuff like sibilance, assonance, and even fragmentation. When someone stops speaking and stutters and pauses, what does that do? And finally, our structural language. And engaging with this is, I think, I've, I've kind of like tiered these. Everyone should be engaging with technical language. And this is the base, like what's actually set. This is what you should be doing. You should be jumping in with a bit more melodic language as well and trying to put that in somewhere, like the way words sound, the, the rhyme scheme, stuff like that. And your structural language is very much a cherry on top of the cake. This shouldn't necessarily be your entire analysis, but it really shows an awareness of the text as a whole. And it also makes you link that individual passage in to um, the, what, the wider world of the text. This could be stuff like stage directions, the physical layout of the play, the conventions of a text, the meter, like how, how it's spoken, and context. And these all should be included in analysis. And this really distinguishes your analysis from, you know, um, you're doing well to you're doing excellent. This is one of the things that I noticed that in my essays, I would never talk about. And I went through and read the exam report and I was terrified because they were all so good. But I was like, I'm not going to be able to write like that. I'm going to try and write in the same style. And so instead of putting in a bunch of flowery language like they do in the exam report, I was like, well, they're talking about the structure of the play here or the structure of the poem. I haven't been doing that. And when I started to do that, and when I started to actually look at see how the why these people were scoring highly, I realized that including this demonstrates a great understanding. And it shows how my ideas are linked to the text as a whole. This is really a really, this is, I think, personally, a really good way to distinguish yourself as or distinguish your interpretation. So, for example, and this here, again, is a bit verbose. I've used this one of my own examples. I know it's quite narcissistic, but I know, I know my example is better than I know an ex random exam report once. So in red is like the language techniques, in blue is a structure, and the melody is almost in, um, it is in purple. Now, there is a lot of overlap between a lot of these. So curious, curiously, while the, while the poems can form a skeleton of an AABB rhyme scheme and iambic pentameter, presents a verisimilitude of real life and indeed romantic poetry, so I'm saying, so whilst the, the structure and the way it sounds is very similar to real like real life conversation and also for the type of poetry this guy's trying to create. The aestheticized sensationalism of them all smiles stop together appears in Congress. So I'm saying, well, the structure and the melody say one thing, but the actual language says something very, very different. And that's shown that I'm looking at this, at this text in more ways than one. Indeed, the circuitous euphemism, so I'm talking again, a language technique, but I'm also describing my language technique. So what I'm doing here is I'm not saying there's a euphemism that does this, it makes a reader feel this. I'm saying, this is a language technique, this is what it does, or this is the language technique, this is how it appears, and this, therefore this is how the reader feels. So the circuitous euphemism of too soon made glad, what it does is that it emphasizes that my last duchess is reminiscent of a performance. So again, that's another tip for you to kind of uh, put an adjective in front of your um, meta language. So the examiner knows that you understand what it's doing and then talk about how it impacts the reader. Where the hyperphora of where you ask a question and you immediately answer it, of how shall I say and use a simplistic rhyme scheme with a sense of rehearsal. So here, what I'm essentially saying is, you know, the structure and the melody of the poem seem very normal and very, you know, basic. But the writing of the poem seems very complex and very different from that. In fact, when I look at the writing, the structure and melody no longer seem so basic. They actually seem like a performance. Or the reason why they're basic is because it's like a performance. That in this poem, the, the person who's speaking is speaking like this because he's done this many times. He's performing. That's just an idea of taking different parts of a text to combine to an entire interpretation. So awesome stuff. So I'm going to go through a couple of these briefly, then we're going to jump into a break. So in the previous exam reports, it, it's a little mean of them, a little mean of VCAR, but we're going to use what we can. They include um, excerpts from, from people who haven't performed as well and, they compare, and compare them to people who perform quite well. They don't do this anymore. I always feel bad, uh, you know, talking 
down to someone's writing. I think all writing is great, but I'm gonna use this to kind of show you how VCAR differentiates your, your, your low to medium scorers and your high scores. So here in this one, we haven't done any of these texts and that's fine. I want you to look at the language they've used. First one, the relationship between an individual and the state is central to Shakespeare's play. Um, set in ancient Rome, the play explores the life of a man whose vocation is to serve both his family and Rome. All right, let's be real, this is boring. In fact, anyone who's ever read the text would know this. The examiner knows this. Let's jump straight in with some actual analysis and we can raise all of these points but through the lens of a text. So when Volumnia bows as if Olympus to a molehill, the utter demise of Coriolanus is accentuated by the unnatural creation of a fragmented and distorted familial bond. That's pretty sick. They've jumped straight in with analysis. The eyes of Virgilia and the cracked heart of an otherwise jocular Menenius convey the essence of despair and imbalance of the Roman body politic, which Coriolanus has engineered. So here they're saying, cool, exploring the, the, the life of a man whose vocation is to serve both his family and Rome. They said the same thing, but they're using textual evidence to do it. They're not just pulling it out of nowhere. As such, it is the heart of Coriolanus in an internal conflict caught between his single honour and his contempt for the malignant plebeians, which forges the tragedy of his demise. So they've come up with an interpretation here. This is not no interpretation. This is just retelling the story. They come up with an interpretation here um, because of his contempt and his single honour, and then they've used everything else before it to explain why this is relevant. This is a great example. My next example is this. The first one, the first passage denotes Anthony's affection towards Cleopatra. Anthony states, there is a beggary in love that can be reckoned, which indicates to the audience the degree of Anthony's infatuation with Cleopatra is dominating him. The romance is frequently mentioned throughout the entirety of the play and reinforces a feminist view, which can be doubly observed. This is a close analysis piece. I know it says feminist view, but it is a close analysis piece. It's taken from section B, or they didn't have section, they had only one section back then, but it was just close analysis. This is good. They're relating to textual evidence. This is definitely more of a medium, medium high range, but there's no, there's no actual evidence. They haven't provided any. Let's jump into a high scoring one. So the elemental imagery and grand language of passage three, Shakespeare showcases the multiple facets, facets of Egypt's vivacious queen, unlimited by cultural divides. This is a killer opening sentence. Wait, we're telling the reader exactly what we're going to be talking about. The ritualistic solemnity of give me my robe, put on my crown, invokes the orderly ambience of Rome, where suicide is perceived as a noble act, itself seems to be of the high Roman fashion. They're using quotes to back up, or textual evidence, to back up what they're saying. And so they're, and they're, not just, they're not just saying, cool, this is what this does. They're linking that to an overall idea. Um, in the first one, they kind of just say there is this love and it does stuff about like domination and there's romance. Here it's saying there is this ritualistic solemnity, but despite of that, it is this evidence, essential sibilance of the juice of Egypt's grape, that in, that which invokes the decadence of Egypt. So the, the sibilance that invokes decadence, um, and that exists amongst noble suicide. These two things exist as one. Therefore, Cleopatra's declaration of I am earth, I am fire and air, lends her an amorphous quality separating her from this dying earth. So showing these contradictions has led us to our interpretation. That sort of, again, what I want you to focus on is look at the language. What does the reader say? Use evidence. What, is, sorry, what does the reader think? And then link that to your interpretation. Don't just put in a bunch of random language analysis. Alrighty, we're going to briefly jump into a couple more videos um, and then we're going to take a quick break. Hi, my name is Ophelia. I'm a communication specialist at UBS. As part of my role, uh, I manage external communications and that includes media liaison, journalist relationships, and myself and the team also manage community impact in Australia and New Zealand. So that involves grant giving to various charities and also volunteering. Uh, my biggest career highlight to date is probably managing to transition uh, between one industry and the other. And so when I started off, I was working in luxury fashion and lifestyle, and I made the change to financial services.
Wonderful. That was uh, from Ophelia from UBS, who we're very thankful for all their support uh, for these sessions this week. Alrighty. So we're going to take a quick five minute break here, refresh our brains, get our minds active for the last part of our session on close analysis for today. You all have been doing great work so far. Thanks for all your contributions. Remember, any questions, pop them in the Q&A section of the Mentimeter. But we're going to reconvene here at, at um, 4.12. No, sorry, 4.11. We'll come back at 4.11 and we'll get started um, for our next section. So grab a glass of water, take a break, and see you shortly. <laughs> Alrighty, legends, let's jump in for our final part of today. Before we do, we've got one more quick video for any of you doing English mainstream as well. Hi, my name's Susan and I'm one of the English tutors here at Skyline Hatch and I'll be running the Ransom and the Queen Masterclass for Comparative Text Response. This masterclass is essentially just a deep dive into Ransom and the Queen. So we'll kind of look at analyzing each text separately. Then we'll look at some really good examples of comparisons to answer different essay prompts. And we'll also look at some high scoring and low scoring essay responses to Ransom and the Queen comparative prompts. I hope to see you there. Alrighty, awesome stuff. Okay, so let's continue. We've, got a, we've done a bit on language analysis, what actually is section B? So in section B, we've got to develop an informed analysis of a text demonstrated by relevant and plausible interpretation. Relevant and plausible. Again, this goes back to my Harry Potter uh, analogy. You could write about Harry Potter being about aliens, but you don't have much evidence. You can write about other things with evidence. So they say you require analysis and close reading of textual details from three given passages, at least two to support a detailed explanation of the text. Never do just two. I, I will tell you, I've, I've never seen a high scoring essay um, that has just done two passages. I personally started off with doing two in depth and then mentioning the third where I could, comparing it, et cetera, et cetera. As long as you reference the third, that's fine. Now, it, it's not good to do three mediocre interpretations of three passages. If you feel like you can't do three good interpretations, uh, or a good interpretation of each passage, don't worry. Do two of them and reference a third, but always make sure you've talked about all three. You've also got to an analyze how key passages, moments, and views and values are suggested to contribute to an overall interpretation and understand how views and values may be suggested. So you've got to look at the wider picture, the wider text. The classic stitch up for VC students, and this is what I was doing when I was in year 12, I would write, I'd do paragraph, passage by passage, paragraph by paragraph, and I'd write a separate analysis in each of them. At the end, there'd be no link between any of them. Your analysis is about the three passages and how they impact the text as a whole. They've been chosen for a specific reason. They haven't picked out three random passages. They've been, Vika hasn't done that. They've chosen them for a reason. So make sure you try and add, add it all together and come up with an overall interpretation. How I suggest you do this, and I touched on this earlier, you analyze the effect of the language device, you discuss how the effect lends itself to an interpretation, and examine how that feature affects the reader's understanding. So what is the effect? And that can be something as simple as the aestheticized sensationalism or the um, explosive language or like the uh, abrasive rhyming scheme. Then discuss how the, uh, the, the effect lends itself to interpretation. It might illustrate X, Y, Z, and then you talk about how that impacts the reader. And here's a quote from the exam report. The highest scoring essays were highly eloquent and were able to draw thoughtful and subtle connections between observations about the text and inferences made. Now, when it comes to actually designing your, um, when you, it comes to actually designing your, your essay, you can do it in two ways. You can do a paragraph per passage, a passage by passage, it might follow the chronological timeline of the passages of the character development ETC. I personally prefer to do theme by theme. Theme by theme is harder, but it allows for a bit more complexity. So I would look at like my three poems or my three, my three passages, and I would say, cool, I can talk about 
the one and two share a theme, right? And I can then use that to talk about how the third doesn't fit. And I can use that to kickstart my analysis of the third, compare that again to the second in the theme they share, et cetera, et cetera. Very much up to you. Now, the structure here is going to be a little different. So your intro, like you don't want to waste time on introduction. You're not getting marks for your understanding of all the nuances. You're getting marks for your interpretation and your analysis. If you write an introduction, in my opinion, you're wasting valuable time and valuable space that you could be used to, you could be using to talk about the language. So I think your intro should just be your first paragraph where you begin with analysis and give a shallow overview of the overall interpretation. Again, you can structure passage by passage or theme by theme. But personally, I began my first paragraph by comparing two poems, poems, discussed one in depth and used a comparison or lack thereof to transition to the third. So for example, whilst the soft phonology of place, pace and face reiterate the simplicity inherent in romantic idealizations of love. Great, so I've talked about you know, what the effect of language is, what language does and the, the impact. <coughs> Apologies. Um, the liberating blank verse of the, of the second poem, Fra Lippo Lippi, foregoes in order to asceticism in search for a sense of freedom that lies in the recognition of imperfection. Cool, so I've compared my first two. Indeed, as Robert Browning litters his prose with ellipses and hyphens, the seizure he creates emphasizes a difficulty in articulating the impressionistic concept of soul as the prior attempts to transfix Lippi's work into something more perfect. So great, I've now kind of used that to kickstart, use my analysis to kickstart my interpretation. Here, Browning excoriates the imposition of one's own subjective truth onto reality's ephemeral metaphors of fire, smoke, illustrate the ridiculousness of enforcing such incorporeal concepts over the empirical nature of faces, arms, legs, and bodies. And I've, again, I've used the, the previous stuff and the previous evidence to sort of kickstart my analysis. Your structure should either, your passages, paragraphs should either focus on a passage or a theme, but you don't need a defined order. Ensure your analysis is expressive and insightful, and you're aiming to maintain an interpretation. Again, you're, like, again, with the building a cake analogy, you want to get the cake at, at the end, and your first paragraph is the eggs and, the, and the, the flour, your second paragraph is the milk and the butter. Your third paragraph can't suddenly be like the, the pickles and the tomatoes, because that doesn't fit in. They need to make sure you're, you're having an interpretation um, and that kind of fits in. It doesn't, it, you can do a paragraph that's about, you know, an opposite idea, but you've got to make sure you link that into the overall interpretation. You should be making your reference to views and values, the author and society beyond the text, as well as other parts of the text. It's really, really important to show that this is a whole list. You, you're not just analysing three passages, you're analysing a whole text using the three passages. So referencing other parts of the text and just references, not analysis, shows that this extends beyond the three passages. It shows that it goes into, into the wider world. And like with section A, as I was just saying, and critiquing your own interpretation can add nuance. Your conclusion should still continue with language analysis. And I would just pop this on at the end of my final paragraph. It's really important to make links to important parts of the text, especially the ending, and strengthen your connection to text wider meaning with views and values. So I said here, although conformity is inherent to the very bedrock of his poems, Browning's presentation of the very real world in which nothing is glamorized in Friar Lippo Lippi, one of the poems, lends itself to the search for meaning in the bleakness of modernity. Now, I can't just say this. This isn't, I can't just say that it does this, but all of my body paragraphs have been talking about this idea. So I've kind of summarized what I've been saying. Indeed, in the rapidly changing world of the 19th century, Browning rejects the romantic discourse with which he's become familiarized for a tactile, albeit depressing, reality. So here, and that's my final, um, my final big interpretation. I'm saying, you know, there's a changing world. Browning's poetry, and I've talked about, and again, in my, in my um, paragraphs, I've talked about how Joey Browning has a lot of romantic work, but he, then he's also letting that go a bit. It's shown that he's, he's rejecting this discourse and he's, um, in, he's favouring the, the real world in which we live, which is, can often be depressing. Awesome stuff. All righty. So 
we're going to spend a bit of time analyzing some poetry. We'll go through some stuff. We're not going to spend too long. It's going to be a couple of minutes here, but I'll read through this poem. This is one of, on one of the texts that you may be studying. If you have, great. If you haven't, cool. Let's just look at specific language examples and sort of work out. And again, if we go all the way back, if you excuse me going back to this, Look at the effective language device, how the effect leads to an interpretation, and how it impacts the understanding of the reader. First, are you our sort of person? Do you wear a glass eye, false teeth, or a crutch, a brace, or a hook, rubber breasts, or a rubber crotch? Now, when I read this out, pay attention also to the way I'm reading it, because that goes back to the ideas we talked about earlier, the technical, the structural, and the melodic language. Stitches to show something's missing, no, no. Then how can we give you a thing? Stop crying. Open your hand. Empty, empty. Here is a hand to fill it and willing to bring teacups and roll away headaches and do whatever you tell it. Will you marry it? It is guaranteed to thumb shut your eyes at the end and dissolve of sorrow. We will make new stock from the salt. I notice you are stark naked. How about this suit? Black and stiff, but not a bad fit. Will you marry it? It is waterproof, shatterproof, proof against fire and bombs through the roof. Believe me, they'll bury you in it. Now your head, excuse me, is empty. I have a ticket for that. Come here, sweetie, out of that closet. Well, what do you think of that? Naked as paper to start, but in 25 years, she'll be silver and 50 gold, a living doll. Everywhere you look, it can sew, it can cook, it can talk, talk. Talk. It works. There is nothing wrong with it. You have a hole. It's a poultice. You have an eye. It's an image. My boy, it's your last resort. Will you marry it? Marry it. Marry it. I really like this poem. I think it's really great. I think it's one of those poems where you don't need to really understand as much of what's going on to analyze this. If you haven't seen this, you don't understand too much about it, have a look at maybe the rhyme scheme. Why? What is the impact of having there being some rhyming words, but most of the time there's not rhyme? What is the impact of, you know, these full stops? What is the impact of the questions? Or if looking at the actual language, so um, in 25 years, she'll be silver. What is that telling us? So spend, again, a couple of minutes here. Pick out a couple of points that you feel, um, that you feel, you know, you really like, you really want to analyse, and then you can pop them in the Mentimeter and we'll go through, and I'll run through a bit more of a wider analysis before we finish up with some tips and tricks for today. Again, a couple of minutes here, give it a go. And again, it can just be dot points.
All right, great work there, legend. So let's just go through. So when you first analyze a piece of writing, let's not look at the micro, let's look at the macro. So the first things first, let's talk about what it actually, what it actually is. Well, this is a dramatic monologue. It's an assessment, assessment of the, the applicant. The structure builds the illusion the applicant daily needs a wife who the speaker strips of their agency. It's a sales pitch. That's what it is. What are the major language techniques? Repetition. This repetition isn't, it's a bit creepy, but mostly it drives repetition. There's no real rhyme scheme or proper meter, but the variability um, succeeds in creating an illusion of conversation. It actually seems like even there's one person speaking, but the change in how they're speaking, the rhyme scheme, everything like that, uh, creates this illusion of, of conversation. And in the context of this, this is something you should know about all of the essay, all of the uh, text you analyze. Um, Plath actually um, died by suicide shortly after an anthology, his poem was released. And the fractured and depressing nature of the poem offers a bit of insight into, you know, how she was feeling. So first things first, are you our sort of person, a false eye, a glass eye, false teeth, or a crutch, a brace, or a hook, rubber breast, or a rubber crotch? The R implies a larger organisation, maybe society itself. The nondescript setting forces the reader into applicant's shoes. I sort of imagine like a, you know, a very um, classic sort of like office building, you know, cubicle, stuff like that, and they're talking to someone. Um, the sort of person confines masculinity into a binary, like they can't be, or that they can't have anything fake on them. They can't be disabled or anything like that. And the polysyndeton and the repeated R sound stress it, and the stresses invokes a very guttural, aggressive tone. This is the, the melodic stuff. So looking at the or, or, rubber, or, rubber. It's quite aggressive. Um, the stitches to show something's missing. The sibilance emphasizes a very fast paced tone. Um, the stitches to show something's missing and the fast paced tone sort of makes it normal or normalizes this discrimination. Uh, and the hyperphore of empty, empty. You know, it's a question and it's a statement. And it, again, emphasises a, a further sense of quick conversation. And it also foreshadows, you know, the hand, giving your hand away in marriage, foreshadows that this is about women and femininity and women's roles in society. The enjambment, or the lack of enjambment, rather, symbolises a sense of finality in the speaker's expression. The stop crying, line by itself. That is it. That is what you have to do. There's no continuation of this conversation over. Then this uh, imagery of this disembodied hand to bring teacups and roll away headaches um, parallels with the thematic misogyny, the, the, the misogyny that exists throughout this poem, um, reducing the wife that he's being offered to the domestic duties and the stripping the agency. And it is it's not her, it's it. That's quite dehumanizing. And the objectification of the consumer's guarantee it is guaranteed. Again, it's like a sell pitch. You get a guarantee. Again, links back into this idea of, you know, it's uh, marriage in this example. It's something like a, a trade or an exchange as compared to love. And the vivid imagery of the self, the sorrow prevent, presents a poetic tapestry that suggests the woman's codependency with references to the fact of that this is opinions of wider society. The, the, the use of we, the continued use of are. It's not one person talking. It's this person talking on behalf of society. Salt and the new stock furthers the connection to the woman being sold, but also the like salt of the earth, uh, that, that sort of allusion to that indicates this is how women are generally treated. But also salt is, you could, again, we can analyze this stuff more than once. Salt can also be references to the tears that you might cry. And it shows that women are unwilling to slay for society, that they're crying because of it. The fit and it, proof and roof and it, so A, A, B, B, A. There's now a rhyme scheme. It's kind of weird. Um, and it imbues a sense of familiarity. Um, but the simplicity of the rhymes, it's a very simple rhyme scheme. It suggests the speaker isn't really bothering. He's done this so many times. It's like a performance. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to do it. You know, it, it's not complicated. Um, and, um, you know, the absolute lack of an answer from the from applicant parallels their protector role uh, society forces them until they die. So it's saying that you you get the wife and you have to protect her until you die. That is your only duty. Which again leads into this misogyny that women can't protect themselves. 
this reductionist simile of naked as paper. It, it, again, it's comparing someone to paper. That's yikes. Um, and it loses this description of them that illustrates the speaker's belief that women are nothing more than what he makes of them, it, hidden away in the closet or until they're needed for a bargain or a sale. That the applicant's hand is empty, that the head is empty, it loses the previous stanzas, and the feigned politeness or oh, excuse me, uh, I have a ticket for that. Um, in my view, and again, this, this isn't a definitive uh, interpretation of the poem, this is my view and how I would pick this apart. It kind of shows that we idealise these corporations and these sales pitches that, that, that contribute to this misogyny. Um, but we, 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 we celebrate them for doing the bare minimum. And, they, and, they, um, and they, they do these evil consumerist actions, but they do them under good pretenses. And again, women are stripped of their agency as a wife's in, wife is framed as an investment. She'll be silver in 25 years, but in 50 years, she'll be gold. You're, 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 you should take her because it's going to be worth your money. It's an investment. That's not a good way to talk about women. It's not a good way to talk about anybody, right? People aren't investments. People are, are people. Um, and the shorter lines and the near rhymes contribute to a quickening of pace. And you see at the end of the poem, I sped up. And I didn't speed up because I chose to. I sped up because the lines were making me speed up. And that is almost like, again, the sales pitch. You're getting to the end. You really want them to take this deal. It's urgent. It, and it creates a sense of urgency. And the repetition of talk, 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 um, it, it's, like, it's like a climax. It's a crescendo. It's getting louder and louder and louder. And it silences any of the applicants. You know, objections. They're talking over them. The crescendo of the poem, um, thematic misogyny arrives at that, that dehumanizing, sexually euphemistic comparison to a living doll. And Plath, the author here, strips the woman of her agency, potentially just as she feels like society has stripped her of her own. And this is where we start to do this on their analysis is, is getting good. This is where we're linking our analysis to views and values and to the author themselves. Remember, it's the author that's writing this. And finally, you know, the frequency of the in-person pronoun, it dramatically increases. The speaker's becoming a bit more desperate and not only to close the sale, but also desperate to completely rid this woman of her femininity. The desperation of the you, you, my boy, it's yours. Again, it's like a sale pitch. It's like, you know, when you, you've got a scam call and someone's trying to be really, really nice to you to try to sell you something. Um, and finally, will you marry it, marry it, marry it? It's phrased as a question, but there's no question mark. It, it's a demand. Um, and it's like the repetitive, you know, misogynistic knocks that they're, they're like the, the, the nail in the coffin. They're, it's like you will marry it, marry it, marry it. This is the end. Um, and, and it's nail in the coffin of femininity closed for the, for, for the market, essentially. That's how I would look at this. We've got a couple of great um, examples in the Mentimeter as well. So this is a second paragraph that analyzes this poem. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about, you know, what they've done, and this is how you do the high scoring essays. So, plus of evocation of societal expectations frames a contemplation of entrapment. So, Plath feels entrapped. Through the repetition of the words rubber, rubber, and empty, empty, re to the evocation of waterproof, shatterproof proof that echoes the bombs in the following line from the applicant, Plath conveys the notion of entrapment. Great, so they're now talking about what are these what are these language techniques actually doing to the reader, whereby the repetition of language forms an unbreakable barrier that cannot be penetrated. This is emphasized by the final line, betraying a central theme of the objectification of woman. Cool, so we've talked about, okay, the language technique, what it does, and how that leads to the overall wider view of the reader. It's the objectification of woman. Then let's continue. Class evasion of the confines of convention, namely the exclusion of a question mark that we just talked about, transforms a phrase into a statement whereby the bridal figure is trapped without question. They are trapped. Plath depicts that the living doll was naked as a paper to start, betraying the recurring notion of the self-depreciation which echoes throughout her poetry, whereby the speaker views herself as a shadow of thin and tenuous cut paper, reflecting the effacement of a self-identity. All of this is using language as its base. They make references to the poem and poetic conventions as well as a wider anthology, and they use quotation to further their contention beyond just analysis. But the majority of quotation is analyzed. And this is the final part of the last paragraph. However, 
The world then turns clear as water, indicating the transparency of the suffering in the world, illustrated through the red shred and the intensification of pink to red, epitomizing the very duality within plus poetry in which suffering and creativity are inextricably intertwined. It's a long sentence. I wouldn't recommend writing that long, but could, uh, there you go. The, jet, the blood jet is poetry, implicating pain as a catalyst of meaning. Cool. So they come to a point here, the catalyst for meaning. Thus, Plath evokes amongst a dark crime, there will always be a possibility for blessings constituting the essence of her poetry. They're talking about why Plath is doing what she's doing. Plath's poetry offers a courageous truth that elucidates the plight of those attempting to understand the ambivalence of the human experience. Through illuminating the contemplation of identities and the confines of convention, Plath ultimately creates a raw depiction of experience. Encapsulating and employing the mechanism of literature to depict the transiency of the humanity amongst the timeless capacity of the elements. So they then do go on to a sixth paragraph um, that discusses the themes, which is still your language analysis. But they um, that they kind of they kind of, here they're kind of summarizing the and coming more to conclusion. You can see the interpretation is much more refined in this one than it is in the first one building towards that interpretation and every piece of language they analyze is another piece of evidence that allows them to say this they can't say this without evidence every other language analysis that we haven't read helps them do this so i've got some tips and i've got a checklist for you so you don't need a defined structure and i think it's very wasteful to start with a mainstream like introduction as you're being assessed on your ability to analyze language that's how I jumped my grades from how I was doing to how I did. I stopped wasting time with stuff that I knew wouldn't get me marks. You should make at least one reference to tonal shift per essay and a first and second thought should be used. What this means is referencing stuff like the structural things should be done and you should do it at least once. Tonal shift is a great one where the tone and the atmosphere of the passage changes. If we go back to our poetry, you can see at the tone here is quite desperate towards the end and the tone at the start isn't that. That's something we could talk about. That's something great to talk about. Um, first and second thought is where you sort of look at a piece of language and you analyze it. And then you look at another piece of language and then you analyze that, but, and then you analyze them in connection to each other, which comes up with a new interpretation. Things can exist, on their own in a vacuum, but we're not talking about what the language technique does by itself. We're talking about it in terms of the wider scope. You should reference to the author and the time period and that, that strengthens your demonstration of textual knowledge. And your interpretation shouldn't be a simple explanation of a plot or a character point. It should be something specific, interesting and engaging. Usually something to do with how the world, uh, something to do with how the, the world beyond the text, how we should act or whatever. For example, for Cat and Hot Tin Roof saying that, um, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof is about um, brick hiding as homosexuality. That's not a good interpretation. You could say Cat on a Hot Tin Roof is about the way the American dream forces men and or forces characters, men and women, um, forces characters to abide by rigid social guidelines with which, which they don't believe. That's much better. It's much more detailed, but also allows us more space to explore that. So here's your checklist. You haven't analyzed the passages individually. Your interpretation has been maintained throughout and analysis interlinked. You've cited beginnings, turning points, and resolutions from the text as insights into the story and related those back to your analysis. You've shown how the passages are holistically significant to the text. You've analyzed language, not just retold the story. Um, you've used a range of language features and you've introduce a basic interpretation and use analysis to slowly build um, to something more complicated. Alrighty. That there was our rundown on lit perspectives and close analysis. We've done really well. We've got 20 minutes left to go through some exam prep and some Q and A. So um, as well, I think I'm, I'm gonna jump in and pass over to you here for just a second. How did you go about, you know, after you'd, you'd finished your, all your classes, you had the exam in a month, what were you doing for literature? So me personally, I did a lot of essay writing. I know everyone says I practice essays, but it really helped me um, to just, you know, 
practice well one formulating my ideas in an essay within a time limit although I didn't initially start off with a time limit um but yeah then like transitioning to doing it under time limits just to make sure I could get all my ideas done within the time frame and I guess just um really making like I think I used to make tables with like my clear ideas um like for the various texts I think I did Heart of Darkness and um Ariel so what we were looking at <laughs> um so I just like yeah really got my ideas into like one table um and just did a ton of essays that was mainly how I prepared for my exams um but yeah how about you awesome. yeah no no I did the same thing I think it's important to to go through and, and read your text one more time make sure you're fully understanding them and jumping into essays so that's what I'm going to talk about now so first things first you may have read your book Fantastic. I hope you all have by now. Uh, pretty, pretty worrying if you hadn't. Um, but let's talk about what goes on outside the, the text you're looking at. Historical and author authorial context is incredibly important. What the what the what the society, the time period is like, and what the author believed them was like. A key principle in VC lit is to discuss the principles embedded in the text, and the principles will have drastically different meanings depending on who wrote them and how they are written. You know, uh, an author today um, could write the same story as Shakespeare, right? The same story and plot lines, but they're going to be vastly different in the context and the messages because Shakespeare, as a as a man in you know Elizabethan England, is going to have a very different experience to someone today. So, when considering views and values, look at when the text was written and what, so when the where the author's from, when they're set, whatever. Um, has there been a recent conflict? What's the economic situation like? Is there a grand narrative like, say, the American dream or by extent, the Australian dream that might be a, a, a big influence on someone's life? And what did the author think of society? We can have, I, I've read countless essays where people talk about how um, the author, the, the text is so, you know, con it condemns your American society and it condemns um, the way things are run but the author is actually like a patriot, like a nationalist or, or whatever. And it's, it's not really fair to make those assumptions uh, because you haven't read into who the author is and, and what they believe. So um, your views and values should also, uh, they also mentioned that you need to, you need to include them and score highly. And, and again, I want to reiterate author and setting really, really important. So this is something I did for, for my, one of my sacks. Again, I apologize for using so many of my own examples, um, but es essentially um, this sack was about uh, the text called The Anchoress, which is about uh, a woman who gets essentially locked up to become, it's almost like a monk to, to pray in, um, to pray in um, a, like, like a small room in a church where she's locked up forever. Um, awesome. Um, so, Oh, this is what I said. It was written by a modern day author, by an Australian author. So whilst juxtaposed against the violence of the bishop's zealotry, the inherent patience of gently toned, weighted and deep breath exemplifies the multifaceted nature of faith in Cadwallader's, the authors, the alienation of 13th century society. Not a huge deal, just a bit of an intro to what I'm saying. This is, this, this is the big thing. Indeed, that one of the characters' belief in God is not compromised by his investigation into what Volkey said the bishop did, embodies Cadwallader's own self-admitted dissonance with the church, but not Roman Catholicism itself. I, I found that this random article she had written about how she no longer goes to church, but she still believes in religion. And I kind of linked that in to what the book is saying, that you can still you know, go against, you know, hierarchy and, and the teachings of, of, of this in this particular example, like the, the violence of, of, of that time period, but you can still have faith. That's a really, really important thing to pick up on that, that these ideas in the text are probably the same ideas the author has. And it's really great to show that you know that and you understand that. This is a sort of a grading section. I believe this is from 2018. Um, where you can see a lot of the marks are around, you know, your 11 to 13 mark, average is 12.2. Not many students get 20. The reason why they someone to get zero is if they don't write something or if they repeat a, a, a things. If they've done a play here and a play here, they'll instantly get a zero for the second one, which is why the average for the second one is lower in, in my understanding. So it's really, really important that you make sure you don't do the same 
text or even the same type of text for both of these. You can see here, your, um, you, you need to, to, in order to get like an A plus, you're looking at about, or oh, sorry, in order to get a 45 study score, you're looking at about an A plus on the exam, which is looking at that 18 to 20 mark. Um, and this is just, again, for those of you who want to, to, to work out, you know, what sort of mark you've got to get in the exam to get a certain study score, something like this is really, really useful. So your 30 study score is going to be roughly correlated to a, to a C plus to a B, which is awesome. All right, talk a little bit about prep now. So when you're prepping, I want you to reread your texts. You should have these down like the back of your hand. Research the author, the time period and prepare quote backs. Someone wrote down in the Q&A, hey, I, don't under I can't remember quotes. Write them down, get a bank of them. If you don't remember them perfectly for section A, look, no one's gonna penalize you for that, but it's best to know them. Next, let's do some practice writing. Try using the same prompt with different perspectives, uh, read scholarly articles in the text, and finally, you know, evaluate essays and ideas. Read through your essays and work out, what can I improve? You know, you're in a stressful time when you're writing an essay, the adrenaline's pumping. You can go back, you know, a couple of hours later and say, okay, that was a bit silly. I know not to do that one again. Awesome. So now just before I go through a bit more detail, what I'm just gonna do is we're just gonna post the um, survey into chat. We do this every session. We do a bit of a survey. Let us know how we're going or what you're feeling, what we could improve on, what you've liked. It's really important for us to, 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 to do that. Um, there's also a chance to win a $50 voucher. The winner will be announced um, on Monday, which is quite exciting. Um, so take a couple of seconds now to open that up and start filling that out. We can fill it out you know, throughout the next few things. Um, but it's really important that that you guys do that. And I'll do another reminder at the at the end. In terms of section A, I made these little uh, documents and apologize for the bad picture, but I would essentially memorize details about key moments in the text. I, I said, look, mine was a play. I'd say, what are the key moments it's here, here, and here? And I'd think of quotes and ideas that link to those. So I've got quotes from a variety of different things. I've got ideas that I could fit into my section A because I didn't know the prompt until I got in there. And I also compiled evidence and events under themes that link to a perspective. So for a feminist perspective, for example, you could be looking for examples of a loss of agency or the heteronormative or hegemonic male or female characters just being mothers, that sort of thing. So develop a phrase in a quote bank and try and memorize those quotes. The more practice essays you do, the, the better they implant in your brain. For section B, I would recommend going through and especially your key, if it's poems, do with all of them. If you're doing a text, go through your key moments, go through the start and the end, go through the big res the, the big the, the big things that happen in the text and analyze them like this. VCAR aren't going to give you three random passages. So they, they're going to choose three passages um, for a reason. And they're often going to choose these big ones in the text. So for poetry, I would thematically organise them. I would say, okay, Porphyria's Lover is about theme one and two, and the next poem is about theme two and three. So I knew if I got those two poems in the same uh, exam, I could compare those two very easily. You should be memorising, again, key moments, crises, major changes. And I personally would develop generalised interpretations, as I talked about before, about like the beauty of art or about the, the giving up romantic poetry for the real world. And I kind of use that as a bit of a skeleton. So not a base essay, but I had a few ideas that I could kind of apply to most of the poems that I could then use to start building like the ingredients for my cake and like the cake being my interpretation. And practice like you're in the exam. It's very different from writing an essay on a computer than it is to writing one by hand. I would say at this point, you shouldn't be writing any more essays on the computer. Even if you need to submit something, write it by hand, take a picture of it. That's what you need to, that's a skill you need to be practicing. If, you're, if the examiner can't read your writing, you're not going to get the marks. In terms of planning, I would spend reading time reading your passages and prompt and spend at least five minutes of reading time and the exam, so 10 minutes total, to construct a brief plan at first in your head and then as soon as the exam starts, getting it right, written down. You can also practice planning without um, we should also you can also practice planning without writing an exam. And your plan should include your key points, general interpretations, um, and uh, don't you need to waste time with explicit detail. Save that for your essay. Um, 
Awesome. So section A, you know, deconstruct your prompt, um, identify the key aspects to link to your perspective, develop an overall interpretation, and um, jot down those key quotes and, and references you'd like to use. A uh, section B, I would go through on the, on the exam and highlight your passages, but don't waste time annotating. You should already have annotated. If you've got to annotate during the exam, you can, but it's not a good, good, good uh, way to spend your time. Highlight the key stuff instead. Focus on the similarities and differences between the passages, especially in tone, in theme, in technique, in message. And you can use that to jump right into your analysis and spend some bit of time thinking about how all three of these passages contribute to the meaning of the text individually and all together. Like what would the text be if those three passages that you're given were removed from it? How would that change the text? Alrighty. So we're gonna spend our last bit of time um, going through, um, last bit of time going through our uh, Q&A. Um, what I'm just going to, we're just going to, again, a flag bump on the, um, bump on the uh, survey. Um, if there's any issue with the, um, the subject there, don't stress too much. We might send an updated one or just fill in, fill in that one. Um, alrighty, so... Let's jump into Q and A. So, feel, remember, feel free to pop in your, your Q and A questions. Uh, but as and I will we'll jump into that right now. So, we've just talked about what happens if you don't remember the exact words of a line. Don't stress too much. Try and remember, but and try to do that quote bank. But a sneaky tip for you is, even if you're doing something for section A, they're still going to provide three passages for you in case you were doing that one for section B. So you can kind of go to the section B one and get a few quotes if you need, if you've run out of quotes during your exam. That's my top tip there. Um, did I eat a dictionary? No, I, I, I like to use lots of flowery language. I look back on my, um, I look back on my, um, on some of my language, I'm like, oh my goodness, how did I do that? A lot of the language in literature is very flowery. You don't need it to be like that. So what I did is I was reading these exam reports and all this ridiculous language. And I'm like, oh yeah, to get full marks, that's how I've got to write. I've got to write with these crazy words that I've never seen before, et cetera, et cetera. So when I did that, I did even worse. So then I decided about halfway through the year, I was like, let's go back to down to the minimum. I'm not going to bother with flowery language. My essay is not going to sound good. I'm going to get my ideas down. And I actually did better doing that than I did doing the flowery language. And I was like, oh, maybe I'm onto something here. And then over time, I was able to build up and develop that flowery language. The flowery language doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't really, like it helps a bit with the marks, but it's not what you're marked on. You're marked on the content. The content should be your first priority, your first and only priority in my opinion. Um, Asma, do you have anything to add there? Um. No, I think you said it perfectly. I, I did have like somewhat of like a vocabulary bank. That was actually for English though. And it was just like various synonyms for words I kept reusing because my teachers would point yeah. out if, I, if there were words I kept repeating. So I would go afterwards and then see if I could find synonyms. But yeah. No, that's awesome. That's really, really awesome. I think it's, I would always use um, like vitriol was a word I'd always use. I just liked how it sounded. And my teacher ended up getting like, Josh, I, I swear, if you use vitriol one more time, I'm, I'm going to give you a zero. Because I'd use it like seven times in the same essay. So it's another really great point. Yeah, get some get some diversity in the language you're using. Great stuff. How long would you take to plan one essay as a practice? As some practice ones, go through and spend you know, half an hour practice, uh, planning. But again, try get like you you want to practice planning because if you get to the exam and you've been planning, you know, for an hour for each time, a half hour for each time, and you get in, you don't have that time in the exam. That's not great. But the same as with any exam, you wouldn't go and sit a timed exam as your very first attempt for any subject. You can practice planning and practice getting used to that, getting used to that in half an hour and twenty minutes, and you can start scaling that down as things go on. How do you talk about text as a whole if you're doing poetry? Oh, messy question. It's about what the text means overall, what the anthology is showing. So, so it's less important for poetry, a close analysis, but it is important to show, you know, all of these poems are collected together for a reason. Same as with 
Ariel, Robert Browning, any set of poetry that given in BC literature, they've got a shared idea or a shared theme, right? Or that they exist together because the author has written them together. Um, you want to be talking about links to other poems in the anthology that aren't referenced in your three passages um, and talking about how they also contribute to the ideas you're, you're getting. So talking about like what all of them mean together. As well, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you did with, with Ariel. Do you have any insight there? Sorry, I was just trying to unmute myself. Um, yeah, from what I remember, like, yeah, it was quite, like, I, that's the thing, you have to really know your text um, if you want to talk about it as a whole as well. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I have any specific tips. I guess just, like, look for the key ideas that, that you can connect and relate back to the text as a whole. I'm not sure if that's awesome. Uh, I, th I think that's a, that's a perfect point. Um, we'll do a couple more questions. I just want to flag, make sure you fill out that survey, chance to win for dollar voucher. Uh, we've got, there's two links. Obviously, the previous one did have that legal uh, legal studies on it. Not a huge deal if we filled that one out, but there is a new link there if you'd like to like to fill it out for, for the legislature session. Again, doesn't matter if you've already filled it out for the legal one. That's fine. All righty. Um, our next question. Oh, um, let's have a look. Oh, sorry, we've done all of this. Oh, and I think we may have finished up all of our questions for today. So I'm going to swap back to my other screen. Again, fill out that survey. Let us know what you think. But um, thank you so much for your attendance today. We've really appreciated it. On the slides, there are a couple of practice ones that I've kind of given to, to, have, to have a go. Um, some are no longer, um, some of you just bit of practice if you want to practice random ones. Um, but section A, I've got uh, one about aerial and how it's ex exploration into the failures of modern society and Carpentaria. Um, and then a couple of poem collections for section B, if you want to have a look at those. Um, there are sessions on tomorrow, which is quite exciting. If you haven't, if we've shown the videos, if you haven't signed up yet, sign up for those. But thank you very much for your attendance today. Um, you, We've really appreciated it. I'm just going to move back can use a QR code here to um, fill in that survey. Make sure you fill that one out. But thank you so much for your attendance today. We've really appreciated it. Um, awesome. Thank you very much. Asra, do you have anything to say? Thank you all for attending. I really hope you enjoyed it. And yeah, Josh, you did a fantastic job. So yeah, awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Best of luck for the exams, everyone. They're coming up soon. But keep practicing, keep working, keep reading your texts. Thank you very much, Skyline Hatch and to UBS for, for the session today, and we'll catch you all later.